Good evening, everyone. Paul Holland here and Luke Sharkey and Nick Monk. And we have some wonderful guests tonight, Peter Eastway and Matt Palmer, that you may have come across in your uh, travels and photography, particularly in Australia. Tonight, um, we're going to have a bit of our preamble and talk about a few things, some good news and some sad news, actually, that's happened and it's rippled around um, the sort of world landscape community, actually. And speaking of world landscape community in terms of landscape, this competition that we're celebrating tonight and exploring um, that Peter has actually founded is um, really stands up as, as one of the great echelons and showcases of particularly the creative aspects of landscape photography that exists in the world. And it's quite rapidly sort of risen to that position. So, so we'll have a bit of a preamble and we'll, we'll get on to our guests. So um, I sort of had a chat with Matt about whether we felt appropriate to talk about it, um, at least asking him in particular, because he's the one in the group that, that is known him personally, but um, a very wonderful man. And, and a few other photographers have lost their lives this week uh, in Iceland. And um, I don't actually know, or I haven't been aware of the, the names of the other photographers that have been released, but um, Matt, do you want to sort of speak to that for a minute? Uh, yeah, well, I knew um, Harold uh, the same way as I guess most photographers did in that we were looking at his Instagram feed in awe at some point or another. Mm. And I think he probably was a big part of the popularization of Icelandic aerial photography. Um, and just uh, the condolences to his family and friends. He was a really friendly, um, super nice guy. I mean, the last time I flew aerials with him, um, it was the day I had to fly out of Iceland and I'm like, well, I'll fly with you, but you have to drop me off at the airport afterwards. <laughs> it's a different airport than what you fly out of. And, you know, that was no problem at all. Um, it was a little bit hard to take the news because I found out online as did a lot of his friends. And I just read about a plane going down in Iceland and I was like, oh, please don't be Heralda. Uh, unfortunately, it was. Um, but from the news that's come out, you know, it sounds like he, despite all of the difficulties that they must have had while they're in the air, uh, he was still able to land the plane safely on an ice lake. Uh, and then it sounds like they may have succumbed to the elements after that. Um, but I kind of thought that spoke to his professionalism and his skill as a pilot, even um, through those difficulties. So yeah, just wanted to um, say a quick word about him and he's a very special person to a lot of people and a lot of um, people are feeling a lot of hurt after that news. But, uh, you know, he's left a legacy of you know amazing photography, but also uh, left his mark on a lot of people. Yeah, he seems to have really genuinely touched people. I don't know anyone that hasn't spent time or flown with him that wasn't really moved by sort of who he was as a, as a person and as his character. Like I, I sort of only got a sense of that secondhand, but I don't know. Do you feel like you could speak to that a little bit about the kind of person that he was? Uh, well, I can say that a friend of his got in touch and um, he said, uh, you know, he said some actual words that would typically be quite mean about him. Um, you know, that kind of bastard leaving us behind kind of thing. Uh, but it's because he was quite an Australian character for somebody that was in Iceland and it would have been completely normal for him to kind of banter with people in that way. That's very unusual outside of Australia. Um, but yeah, he had a, a huge love for nature. I still remember, um, sadly, the same lake that was, you know, involved in during the week, but him flying around and even him having to, you know, look out the window and take in the sights and be really excited about things that he had seen a hundred times before. Mm. Geez, you must have seen every inch of that island um, 20 times over, I'm, I'm guessing. Mm. And we don't know who the other photographers and, or people on board were, do we? Unfortunately, their names haven't been published and maybe that's a good thing or, or not. I'm not sure what the family situations are there, mm. uh, but obviously there were three different nationalities, I think Netherlands, USA and one other that I can't quite recall, but yeah, you know, obviously we've got um, thoughts go out to those photographic communities that have lost people as well. Mm. 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 Yeah, yes. thanks for um, being open to be present with that, Matt. That's not easy to speak to. Yeah, it's um, I really a rough appreciate week. Matt has actually done a beautiful post and acknowledgement of of Harold as well on his own Facebook page, which 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 really moved me and and it's really you know just maybe thought of all the gazillion flights I've done all around, around the world that are, that have been sketchy and close edge and otherwise that I, you know, I, I kind of do kiss a plane every time I land and I, I don't 
go up sort of thinking it's risk free. Um, you know, it's it's the risks we take are, are kind of curious in our lives. Like most people get in a car without thinking about it, and yet that's the most likely way they're probably going to die under the age of forty five um, before we start kicking the bucket for more natural reasons. Um, but yeah, flying's not risk free. Um, Austin's a wild place and it has really extreme weather conditions and huge amounts of wind and lots of volatility in terms of visibility uh, and changeability of conditions. And, you know, my understanding is he was one of the best of the best um, as far as his experience level and skill level. And so that's actually, I didn't know that he actually made it and actually landed the plane, Matt. So that's, that's a huge testament. I also would, would say to, to his skill and courage. Yeah. You can't imagine, you know, like, you take it lightly, but the level of responsibility, you know, of, of people, you know, with three people on the back of your plane, you, you literally got your, your, um, their lives in your hands. And, um, that must, that's part of the reason why I think I'm not a pilot. I don't, I don't think I want to take on that level of responsibility. Um, you would say, so yeah, hate it, Paul, cause you'd be wanting to take photos the whole time and you couldn't. Yeah. Do yeah. That, that too. <laughs> um, so what I have you been it. up to otherwise poorly? Um, I had a bit of a break up the East coast. Um, I managed to get lucky and get some epic Aurora shots um, up at oh, Piccadilly Point. Oh, that was a really Point. good one, wasn't there? Wow. It was a, yeah, it was an absolute cooker, but um, my hat's off to Benjamin Aldridge and Lukey, who um, are all over that, and I'd probably be asleep and have no idea what happens until a week later, and those guys are always always in the loop and checking all the charts and reading these crazy magnetic storm readings that I got no idea what means anything, and I just say, is it going to be any good? <laughs> what time shall I be out there? And, Somehow or other, I, I get lucky. So I literally just finished a, a meeting and, and walked down the beach and, and hit it within one minute of it peaking. So it wasn't exactly uh, driving around half a Tasmania that Lukey sometimes does uh, in terms of commitment. But um, I think I got home lucky. Before, it was, it was raining so all night. A, it was a big one. <laughs> it was raining all night up to that point. So it was it was pretty lucky. It wasn't looking like it was going to be any good. And luckily, I had scouted a few spots during the day. Um, thinking that, you know, knowing that it might be coming. So I had a few sort of envision kind of um, compositions, which is not always the case for me. And, um, and I managed to get them and mm -hmm. I've just put yeah, in you know, bought this new 40 mil 1.8 Sigma lens, which is, I got actually purely for nightscape photography. And um, I've been really enjoying that and shooting at 1.8 at 14 mil is, is a real treat. Uh, it makes a big difference having the right kind of lens for, for night photography work for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, awesome. And how's everyone else going? Um, Matt, Peter, you had much of a chance to get out and shoot lately? I've just done un un uh, miking, un uh, stopping my microphone. I, I got up this morning. I was very impressed. I was up at uh, sunrise, did a couple of photos up the coast. Uh, that's oh, beautiful. About 10 minutes up the coast because if I had driven any further, the sun would have come up and I would have missed the sunrise. So I could only go so far. But, uh, You're still on the good. beaches, be Peter? about. Still on the northern beaches there? Yeah, on the northern yep. beaches. Yeah, yeah, awesome, beautiful. Well, there's plenty of choice over the through there. I, I used it, to it live is up funny, that way. Uh, that, that, yeah, a lot of lot, yeah, because I live here and I I don't really think of it. But that's my little project for this year is to to shoot at home a little bit more. Oh. And uh, so if I don't get to go away because of COVID, still I've I've got something to do. Oh, there's more than enough there. I, I know it relatively well, and yeah, yeah there's, yeah, there's, there's so many different angles and uh, beautiful rock pools and things. So you'd be very mm. spoilt there, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, plenty, plenty to shoot. Yeah, you, Matty. you've done a book before on the northern beaches, haven't you, Peter? I did a um, a calendar on the northern beaches. Calendar. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. yeah. yeah it's funny. Yeah. I had a, a it was a book project. Uh, three of us were doing maybe thirty years ago, um, which was called Headlands on the Northern Beaches. It's still a project. <laughs> one of those Beautiful. ones. Beautiful. We might get it done in, uh, let's see, 2022, maybe 2028, maybe. Well, well, I <laughs> well, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? And a lot of those shots that we take are pretty timeless as well. So we've got plenty of time. <laughs> I'm hoping for that anyway. Mine, yeah, I'm very right. much the same. <laughs> how you, how you been going, Matt? But how's, how's the gallery going? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, gallery's going well. Uh, January was pretty um bursting at the seams and then last week was the first week since we opened that we actually had a day off together so that was good and we're just kind of feeling our way through it because we're by no means experts but we're giving it a good go well i think even experts have to start somewhere don't they so um yeah it's a uh, better better to um, just give it a go and see how, how you go there. So, it's, so it's, for those it's, that it's, don't know, um, Alpine Lights are the name of the gallery and it's up in Bright, which is one of the more stunning parts of um, the southern end of, southeastern end of Australia in particular. 
And Madness partner Mika, who's who's one of the great female landscape photographers in, in the country by far, have um, teamed up in, in Dream Team style to uh, to bring, you know, what's becoming quite a rare and, and precious thing to have a purist kind of landscape um, gallery with with people that have, you know, at the top of their game in Australia. You know, there's Christian out west and, and you know, there's Ken Duncan's been floating around for many years and, and there's you guys, but there's probably not a hell of a lot else that's actually being organized and run um, by the photographers themselves. Peter, do you know, is there many other out, out there in Australia that kind of have a similar... There are a few more around, but you're right, it, and they, they tend to come and go. There was um, one recently that uh, I saw a, a post that they just closed because uh, over COVID they couldn't keep things going. And you, you find that a lot of people, they'll have it as a, a second feather. I mean, look at Tom Putt, for instance, who's, you know, he, he's got his gallery, but he's got all of his tours. And mm. I often find that in the professional world, that someone who's got a, a landscape gallery, they've got a job as a merchant banker as well or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Matt, when are you getting back into merchant banking? You work for Deutsche Bank, don't you? Or is it <laughs> uh, fastest way to make a million dollars is to start with two, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> My banged up Honda. The jazz is giving me away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you got to you got to do something. So, no, that's great, Matt. That's good to hear that. Um, it's um going well, and um, I mean, I still can't wait to get over to Brighton visit and and check it all out. So, um, yeah, it should be awesome. Well, speaking of um, speaking of galleries, I was actually down in the um the Westwinds Gallery yesterday. I had a few clients um from an aerial photography workshop at Lake Here, which uh, Tom's racing about at the moment, who who came to visit and um. And if you didn't know, I've got a, an exhibition, Sky Dreaming, um, which is pure sort of abstract aerial photography from around the world. And that's um, it's been extended for a couple of weeks. So I thought I'd let everybody know. Uh, if you can't get there in person, it's um, skydreaming.com.au. And uh, I've actually just picked up this afternoon uh, an extended exhibition in the Tasman Peninsula where I'm going to be sort of pulling a different curation from, from the same kind of umbrella of work and, and showcasing it in a different area. So I'm setting that up for the 25th of February. So I'm literally like racing pulling telling it down and racing to the other gallery on the same day putting it up and opening the next night so that was that was pretty unexpected but pretty fun awesome. um so it's nice to, uh nice to sort of i haven't actually exhibited uh peter and in, in hobart for or in tasmania for about 13 years it's been all around and it's it's there's something really beautiful about being able to get your friends and to say i'll just pop out for lunch let's go to the gallery and i guess matt's living that now and i sort of had a few weeks of um being able to sort of enjoy being surrounded by your own work, which is pretty rare. Even in my own house, I don't even have a single one of my own images, images on the wall. So, so uh, yeah, it's been a long time between drinks, I think. Um, and I could have easily said it was all too hard during COVID, but um, I'm really glad we um, pushed past, past and just gone for it. It's, it's, there's nothing like celebrating the print form. And uh, I think I didn't really introduce Peter properly to the show. We've had Matt on the show a number of times and, and hopefully many times again. Uh, and, and he's the current and probably forever last standing uh, ARPP Australian Photographer of the Year <laughs> and the last person to kick my ass in the Landscape Photography of the Year in Tasmania. Thanks, Matt. No worries. I was, I was going for number eight, but you took me down, right? <laughs> um, so Matt is an um, incredibly accomplished photographer in quite a lot of genres. He's actually been the um, Documentary Photographer of the Year in Australia as well, in the ARPP, and, um, and he's, he's one of the most, I think, one of the, one of the most eloquent and and contemporary sort of judges I've seen in terms of the way he engages his, his mind and breadth and, and language to, to the visual visual art is, is really quite stunning. And that's one of the reasons he's the first person I asked about tonight to come on the show. Now, Peter's, I couldn't even list the amount of letters behind Peter's name. It's, it's sort of lost in the ether, I think. But he's easily one of the mainstay photographers um, in a wide bunch of genres, but he's, he's also particularly well known for his landscape work and He's a grandmaster in I don't know how many countries now. He was the uh, the active president for the RPP for at least, was it a decade, Peter? Uh, just the APA Awards. So the APA Awards. So. I, I shied away from being president. There's only, I mean, the, the people of presidents are very, very smart people, but not as smart as me. <laughs> yeah, so he's an, an honorary fellow and fellow and of, of I don't know how many different places across different countries, but he's, yeah, and he's also, I think, um, was another reason we're really happy to have Peter on is, is, He's been probably 
and correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I'd say, from my understanding, you're one of the earliest photographers in, in Australia to embrace the digital realm and, and to really start getting to grips with the potential for, you know, shaping work and, and post-production and embracing, you know, Photoshop and different sort of programs. And and you've sort of had a, probably the longest eye run over that path in, in terms of how that shaped uh, photography and, and become a part of and culturally kind of, you know, blended into the way that we um, approach this this craft, and so you know, it's it's quite appropriate, I think, that Peter's Peter's name is on, on is on the founding um, founding board of of what's become quite quickly actually one of the most well established and and well revered landscape photography contests in the world. Peter, do you want to do you want to speak to sort of where where this was born from and and what you envisioned for this particular contest and and where you think it sits in, in the wider picture of the world? I guess um, for myself, uh, you know, being a purely selfish sort of person, um, my, I guess, um, if, if I've had any success in photography, it's because I've entered photography competitions, not because I've won photography competitions, but because I've actually sat down, spent time and put my best work forward and, you know, got feedback. And uh, for all the people out there who've entered a photo photography competition and not done very well, um, I know how you feel. I, I managed to get the lowest scoring print of anybody at the New South Wales um, AIPP a couple of years ago. That's you know, the last time that, that was run. So Matt, you know, we've got Matt over there. He's got the highest score of anybody and I'm over here and I had the lowest score of anybody. So um, but the whole idea of winning, winning is great, but it's not everything. And, you know, for those of you are aware of the AIPP and it's the same with many professional organisations around the world. We have that magic number 80, where if you get an 80, it's a silver award. And all the judges that judge, they talk in terms of 80. And the people who organise the awards try to do all sorts of things to stretch out the, uh, the scores and all that, but it's 80. And if you get 80, you're happy. If you get 79, you're unhappy. And that is actually a positive thing. And that sort of leads into where the International Landscape Photographer of the Year comes in. And it, you know, to give, uh, I mean, we do have first, second and third prizes, et cetera, but the reality is someone who gets first prize over someone who gets second, it's opinion. It's not really better or worse. It's simply opinion. And the, the judges on this day at this particular time decided that that photo was a little bit better than the other one for whatever reason. And so we've got 101 photographs. So the idea is that you enter the competition. Yeah, we've got some prizes there to make it sexy and people think, great, I've got a chance. But really the real prize for everybody, and you know, certainly the feedback I've got from all of the entrants over the years, is that you know, just to get their photograph in the book, to be considered one of the top 101 photographs of the year, that's what it's all about. I mean, this year for the first time, we've got the top 202. Uh, we've got 238 photos on the website because there's only a bee's knee between somebody who gets in the book and someone who doesn't in terms of the scoring range. And, you know, you could really take the next 100 and put them into the book and everybody would still think it's an amazing book. So, you know, Are you able to speak to what that threshold was, up. Peter? Sorry? Um, oh, sorry to interrupt. Are you able to say what the threshold was in terms of this? Yeah, yeah, it's on the website. I think. Okay. 85.4, I think. 84.5, yeah. I think, oh, okay. um, to get into the book. Yeah. And it was 82 point, it might have been, yeah, and it was 82.5 thereabouts for the top 238. So it's only 2% that represents another 100 pictures. I think the, the top score might have been 89 or 90 or something okay. like that. But Peter, and, you, didn't, um, you didn't get my check this year, mate. <laughs> no, no, we did. It just you got, you got it the last seven years in a row, but you didn't get it this year. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of like, it was funny for me because I was like, oh, wait a minute. I was sitting next to a plane next to that person. I was sitting next to a plane next to that person. <laughs> I was sitting next to a plane next to that person shooting the same stuff. But um, I actually, it was something I heard you say, I reckon it maybe it might have even been 10 years ago, Peter. And I, I think it might have been overhearing a conversation where you're explaining that very thing, which I think is a beautiful way to start the show in particular is if you're in the top 20%, it's anyone's game. You know, like like really, and that's where that eighty figure kind of sits in some ways. Yeah, and and you know, being a being a judge and having watched you judge and, and Matt judge and being around judging for a long time myself, it's you know, I'm quite present to the subjectivity that gets that happens at that stage. And it's really it's not particularly predictable or um 
super refined or even that objective sometimes about about once you get past a certain point what separates an image from another Mm. and that's where i love the fact that you've embraced that wider spectrum of 100 for instance you know because the statistical chance of anybody getting in that top three is is pretty low Mm. we talk about four and a half thousand entries or odd yeah we had four and a half that's right four and a half this year which is which is great because and i mean i guess what i like is you know doing a few more shows like this where there is a lot of interest. At, like we have people every year from around the world. Um, I shouldn't say people, media organisations, magazines, websites, etc., from around the world, all tackling. You know, David because he looks after the PR for it. For it. David Evans, my partner in the partner in crime, and you know they're they're actually getting in touch with us ahead of time. When are the competition entries coming out? So people who get into the top 101 are not just sort of speaking to other photographers. Their photos have got a great chance of being distributed all around the world to everybody, which is really, really cool. Yeah, I was um, lucky enough to win Photograph of the Year many years ago. And, um, yeah, it was remarkable <laughs> where, where that photograph ended up across the world. So definitely um, can see that. And that was quite early in the competition too. I'd imagine that network's even stronger now. It's, so, it, it has. It's grown um, a lot, yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's great. And, um, we, and- we, we probably should promote that a little bit more, to be honest, um, because uh, I think that in these days of social media, everybody likes a like. I mean, I put my photos up on Instagram and I only got 73,500 likes this week and I'm really disappointed because normally I get 74,253, you know what I mean? Uh, Yeah, what was it? 73 likes. Okay, so it was around about that. (laughs) But, you know, we all like those likes. And so, you know, to have the photos then go a step further out into the the general populace, I mean, it's amazing Instagram where I get um, like people just contacting saying, I saw your photo. Uh, I saw you on uh, Netflix and stuff like that. And you just get these sporadic contacts from just the most disparate parts of the world. And it's, it, it's, it becomes a little bit of a, a community, I guess. And people are in the know. I mean, you know, everybody knows who the good cricketers are and all the good tennis players are. And there are a few photographers that I know as well. And you've got a bit of a history also running competitions as well, Peter, with the Better Photography Magazine competition. Was that sort of, um, did that uh, running that sort of give you uh, aspirations to maybe take something a bit bigger and make it international? Um, Well, it was really my time as the chairman of the Australian Institute of Professional Photography. um, And that institute, sorry, Australian Professional Photography Awards, I'll get that right in a minute. I was thinking of the next thing because um, I also worked with Bill Herter over at WPPI in the States. and he and I spent quite a bit of time umming and ahhing and working out things as to how we could basically just improve the awards. And it's really good where I see a lot of the foundations that we set up, you know, 10 years, 15 years or so ago, are sort of, you know, they're, they're still there, but they're being built on. And I guess taking advantage of the world that we live in now. I mean, social media is bad in many, many ways. YouTube's horrible in many, many ways. But, geez, it's also fantastic in terms of being able to communicate. And, you know, like we can talk about the quality of photography and where that's going. And in some ways it's being dumbed down because you don't have to do what Matt's doing, put a big print up on the wall. It's just got to show up on a screen. And so, therefore, are a lot of the techniques that we pride ourselves in doing properly, are they becoming superfluous, not necessary? Mm. Or are they? Or am I just going to be a dinosaur and I'm going to stick in there and still do it that way anyway because I, I love it? So it's, it's an interesting time that we're in. But I think that understanding both sides of it, if you just go with the flow and enjoy it, then, you know, it, it's a great time. It's a golden time in photography at the moment. It is really, really great. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, that's um, really interesting to hear the, the background to that. And, and um, in terms of the rules and, and how the competition itself is set up, is that, um, I guess, um, have you spoken much, I guess, around, um, I guess, some people like the more natural uh, processing of images and then the competition allows for a lot more digital work to be done. Is that something that people have commented to you much about? Or Yeah, uh, yeah no, yeah. I've, I've, I've had people, including some we all know very well, who've just said you should call these the Photoshop Awards because it's just all post-production. And a few years back, um, I did a, a, I looked through all of the photos and I, I pride myself on being able to work out whether something's a composite or not. I might not get them all right and I might get a few straight shots, which I think are composites as well. But we had a reckon around 70% of entries that were straight. 
Now, it might be a little bit higher now, and people are better at um, post-production and a few more skies with Photoshop. Um, you know, you can automatically drop in a new sky. Yeah. But generally speaking, I don't think there is much prevalence with composites as we think there is. There's a, certainly a lot of post-production. So if we go back to Tim's awards, the Natural Photography Awards, um, I think there's some people perhaps have a different view from me on what landscape photography is. And if I start off with the idea of landscape, we start off with the world of art and we go from the guys, you know, the cavemen, and we go through, we come up through the, um, the Middle Ages, the old the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, Middle Ages, we come up to the Renaissance. It's only shortly after the Renaissance that we actually start expressing the landscape. And it's still just to depict what is there or to be a background or something or other. And then we gradually move into the, um, the, the more modernist movements, et cetera, where photography comes along and suddenly painting has to go in different directions. But if we look at landscape photography all the way through and landscape art, it has never ever been a representation of nature alone. Yes, there have been some photographers who just do that. There've been some painters who have just done that as well, but there've always been the other painters and photographers who have looked at landscape as an expression of their imagination. So I like to draw the distinction as saying there are nature photographers. And if you're going to put photos of the natural world where there's no hand of man, Good luck finding any photograph without the hand of man these days anywhere in the world, but that's another story. Plenty down but, here. But, but, <laughs> well, I was when I was out in the Western Arthurs, you know, all this beautiful scenery. There's a bloody little trail that I was walking oh, on. Oh, yeah, that there, does you happen. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. Yep. So, 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 and those so, yep. Sherpas, you know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I needed two Sherpas, let me tell you. So I, I, so I can get into all sorts of philosophical arguments about that, and I have my views, but I respect other people's views. There are you know, some people who just like to take an old, you know, like Richard White, you know, he used to you know, love um, giving people a hard time for digital and he got into digital, he didn't think it was too bad, but his preference still was to walk out with, an eight, with a four by five view camera and shoot in black and white because he just liked using the camera. That's what he liked to do. Uh, this morning I was out there and I have a, an Arca Swiss um, with a uh, D DB, sorry, uh, a Cambo, I've got a changer, Cambo DB2 uh, view camera with bellows and, you know, manually um, shut, clicking the shutter. Yes, I've got 150 megapixel back on it, but I just like using that camera. So when people say, I just want to take a straight shot, I don't want to do much post-production, I get it. That's okay. But now let's take a step and move into the world that we all live in today. And you're going to come along to a competition environment and you're going to put in photographs that are not processed. When I say not processed, straight out of the camera, they're raw shots, but you haven't done exposure, you haven't done color, haven't done contrast. So I'm not talking about layers or adjustment brushes, you just haven't refined it. I think we have to do that. And if we're doing that, then what's the difference between taking it a little step further and then a little bit further, a bit, you know, so there's that slippery slope where we don't actually have a line in the sand between pure photography or real photography and imaginative photography or fake photography, whatever you want to call it. And there are all sorts of different people with different standpoints. But it's just a big quagmire in the middle where nobody's really quite sure what is what and what is which. So that's why with the International Landscape Photography Awards, we've got 101 photos. And no matter what style of photography you like, there's room for you in that 101. And when we look at our judges, like Tim Parkin is one of our judges. And he's mm. one of these, you know, crotchety old blokes with a big four volt, you know, what, 11, 14 camera, whatever he uses. Yeah. And, you know, uh, he, but, but he appreciates a, um, a digital composite. It's not his style, but he's got the capability of saying, that is a good example. And, you know, often I will see Tim, he's up there, you know, there, there might be a photograph that's scored very highly and it's a composite. And Tim will be one of the photographers who's given it, one of the judges who has given it a high score because he is able to judge across genres. And I think that's important um, in, in the judges. Now, yep. there are also, in terms of philosophy, we keep the same judges more or less. We try to keep the same core so that there's a certain amount of consistency from year to year. Now, there are arguments not to do that. And there are arguments to do that. We've chosen to do it. That's all. So uh, I can go through all of the 57 different arguments I've had with 37 people around the world over the last 20 years <laughs> about how you choose a judging panel. But it all went out the, the door, um, you know, when I was the APA chairman, because over and above all of that, you're dealing with human nature. And 
you know that when Paul Holland has had two coffees, you're never going to shut him up on a judging panel. <laughs> Dead straight. Watch. You've got no control over that. <laughs> oh, I know that's chime in as well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, being asked to be on the show, uh, I've heard people make comments about Photoshop awards and that kind of thing. And, you know, those same comments have been made about other competitions. Um, you know, I remember a famous photographer in Australia criticising an AIPP competition. And it was like, uh, where were you last year when tintypes were winning the competition? Yeah, so um, I don't buy into that at face value, but I did look through 100 images with a pretty keen eye to see if I felt like that was an accurate reflection. And I'd say probably at least 50% of the images that I saw in this year's 101 were all things that I think could be quite comfortably achieved in camera with minimal adjustments. Mm. So I just don't buy into that narrative, but um, certainly I, I can understand that there, there is the flip side of that, and that does mean there's a 50 images that have um, potentially benefited from pretty substantial adjustments at times too. So I, I, pers I personally feel like it, it's really important to, to celebrate all aspects of the genre and... I think it's becoming a little bit more challenging. I think we're, we're growing up with a generation that are learning to do post-production before they learn camera craft, if they learn camera craft at all. And you could judge that or you could just say, well, that's just how things are happening mm -hmm. and embrace it and celebrate it. And I feel like there is great skill and incredible visualisation and a phenomenal aspect of imagination that deserves to have its forum and opportunity to be expressed. And I feel like having a more open aspect um, to that and a competition like this really allows that to be celebrated and explored and, and expressed and showcased and and it's done exquisitely well I, I you know being a photographer for 25 years I look at some of these images and I'm like I've got no idea how the hell to do an image like that and I don't know if I ever will to my dying days and and as a judge I've had to learn to celebrate and uh, explore and, and put any sort of personal feelings aside to just celebrate the, the, the perfection and beauty and, and craftsmanship of what's in front of me. And so a group like the Light Collective, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the straight shooter of the group. I didn't realize I was. And as we went down the track and started, you know, creating together and putting bodies to work together and doing videos where we talked about our ethos, I remember Adam Williams came out and said, oh, I have absolutely no um, intention to be authentic to the landscape whatsoever. And I was like, oh, <gasps> Like this, and I went to the boys, we can't put that in the video. And they're like, what do you mean? And I got voted down four to one. Mm. I was the only one that even had that thought. And it was, it really put me on my spot about, geez, am, am I a bit closed minded here? Or what, what do I need to sort of open my mind to and celebrate? And I've learned a huge amount from Ricardo, Ignacio and, and Adam and Luke and about just the power of expression and the capacity to move an image to as much about how it feels as how it presented. And that is, that is a sign of a great artist that, that on any, on any medium that has the capacity to do that successfully. Mm. And so I feel like it's, it's a really wonderful parallel to, to celebrate say the natural landscape awards and, and then to now to celebrate sort of maybe in some ways. So the other aspect of that, the other side of that coin maybe is, is how well and how beautifully it's done by some of the great, masters and contemporary photographers in, in modern time and the genre and it's very international mm -hmm. and i really I have to that. take your hat off peter how quickly it's become so i thought it was pretty brave to just straight out say right from the word go this is the international landscape to the words like but it had where's that coming from you know and i and i i wanted to ask you about why you chose that name and where you thought this was going to sit because obviously you put a lot of thought into designing this competition and thinking about where it was going to be placed and whether the timing was right to offer this platform and, you know, how quickly it's evolved because of how you play, how well you placed it. Yeah. I mean, with, this is the eighth year, so I don't, you know, thank you for thinking it, it's happened quickly. I mean, it's a bit like you know, looking at friends, kids and say, geez, they've grown up quickly, but it's quite different when I you're either, bringing either. them up yeah. yourself. So, um, you know, like I think it's a sort of a natural progression. It's, comforting that it's uh, it's growing and I, I think we've got you know more room to grow why did we start off with the international I mean uh, Nathan Oxley was one of the three of us who actually started it off yeah that's right and he did the um he had the aperture awards and aperture, then they got yeah. renamed something and so Loop, it, yeah. it, it came Loop, out of it I don't know where the name com, came from uh, to be quite honest but uh, it uh, seemed yeah you know, we wanted to go after a global market so the idea mm. was you know because we're all involved with APA, 
but it was print only, very much print only. It was Australia centric, et cetera. And we could just see with you know, digital technology, the potential for doing something international. And we knew how good all the photographers were around from the, all around the world because you know, I'd be judging over in England or over in America, et cetera. And you just see all of this amazing stuff. So we knew that there's an international audience. So that was the idea behind it, it was to be all encompassing. And it's interesting, the first one or two years, you know, possibly 50% of the entrants that were in the book were Australian. Mm. But now it's um, much, much smaller. I haven't actually yeah. looked, but it's, yeah, it might only be 10% of that these days. And we yeah. get people from all around the world. And it, uh, it's, 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 as I say, it, it's really great to be a part of it. I mean, that's where David and I, I guess, are good um, you know, holders of the, the, the baton, for want of a better word, because we're both as passionate as each other and as our entrance about photography. I mean, we, we, we do hours and hours on this, but they're hours of enjoyment. And so you don't actually count the hours. And then you get to talk to people about it and you're talking about photography, you bitch and you moan about that one because it shouldn't have been in, it should have been another one. You know, you've got all of those conversations that we had all the way through APA. I mean, you know, I was involved with APA for you know, 40 years and you know, it has become a part of my life. It's now gone. So we're looking at other things to replace it. Probably all enter the NZIPP awards this year, won't we? So. I, I, think, um, I think with um, competitions in general, uh, landscape photographies, photographers um, enjoy a, having a choice. And, they've, and, and now that we have a number of established competitions, um, there is a bit more choice. Um, I know uh, talking to quite a few people, and you know, I'm a fairly straight shooter when it comes to photography, as you would know, Peter. Yes. Um, the unapologetically. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, look, I, I completely appreciate this stuff as well. However, um, there wasn't a lot of choice um, in that international space um, when it came to the the rules. So you had your, your Epson Awards and 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 then the, and the international awards, yeah. photographer of the year. Sorry. The Pano Awards, you mean? Yeah, the Pano Awards, the Epson yeah. Pano Awards, and and this one, and they're very both very similar in in terms of their rules, or or for want of a better term, lack their old rules, um, and that I know disappointed a lot of people that they didn't have a portal that they could, um, if they the, the straight, straight shooters, you know, they didn't think they had a chance. Now, a level playing things. field, I guess. Yeah, a level thing. playing field, yeah. and you know, like I I don't. You know, I, if I have a, an errant stick in my image, I don't tend to claim it out because that's just how I am. But I know if I was going to enter it in the International uh, Landscape Photography of the Year Award, I'd probably have to do that um, if it was a distraction to, to have a chance, even though it was otherwise a fairly straight um, um, uh, straight shot. And and um, uh, But then you've got the, the Natural Landscape Awards that have just been established this year, and, and I think we'll all, we, we all acknowledge you have been extremely successful um, in, in terms of even, well, certainly the quality, but in terms of volume as well. It's a, it's, it, I feel as long as the competition remains healthy, it will be around for a long time. Um, and and uh, for me, it's refreshing to have that competition as well. Um, and so now there's a great... A great choice. So if you if you feel that you know you're a bit intimidated, like I am, about entering an Epson Panel Award or or, the, or this particular award, um, I feel like I've got a, a a fighting chance in in the Natural Landscape Awards. Having said that, with fourteen thousand entries or whatever, I don't think I'd have a fighting chance at all. But it's it's probably the perception, and it's it's great that we've got this all these choices now and. And, um, and and hopefully, um, you know, this award and the other awards will hang around for many years to come so we continue to have that celebration of, of landscape photography as a very wide and all-encompassing sort of genre. And uh, hopefully, too, it sort of um, stops, you know, all of the circular conversations that always keep happening. And, mm. you know, now you've got your competition now, guys, you know, you do that and let, let everyone do the other one if that's what they want to do. Yeah, but no I, hope, I hope yeah. that they're not going to not enter our awards as, as well because, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's still 50% of straight captures and, mm -hmm. yes, there might be a little bit more processed. And, but I thank you, Nick. I think you've said that very well because there's plenty of room for more than one competition. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, you know pub, well, I still do publish a magazine, but when we used to put the magazine out in the newsstand, we always used to worry, oh, geez, you know, what were the other people doing? But, you know, people would buy more than one magazine. Mm -hmm. People would enter more than one competition and mm -hmm. it, and I, I like to think that if you're going to enter a competition, well, it's sensible to look at 
what is the story behind the competition? There's one very good reason why there aren't any rules in the International Landscape Photographer of the Year. That's because I was the APA chairman for seven years having to deal, you know, 95% of entrants would do the right thing. And then that 5% that would test the waters and do something odd, they would take up, you know, all of your time and administration, et cetera. So the fewer rules, as long as it's a photograph, mm. then that's, that's all I want to know about. And then it's up, it's up to you. I mean, when we look back at uh, Ansel Adams, which, you know, people show up as being Ansel Adams as being a straight shooter. No, he wasn't. Uh, mm. Look at Edward Weston. He was much more of a straight shooter. But these guys were pushing photography. And, you know, a friend of mine met Ansel Adams and asked him, uh, he said to Ansel, what, what, what would you do if you were my age? And he said, there's this new thing coming called electronic imaging. He said, I wish I was going to be around to play with that. So these guys would be pushing it. Where are we today? We're at a position where we've got access to the most modern techniques possible. Why wouldn't we go and explore them? Having said that, Nick, realise you're over the 27 now. You've seen it all. You've looked at it and you say, I can see the, um, the composite, the, I can see the highly processed, I can see the straight. My heart is in this part. Mm. That's where I want to go. Why not? That, that's, yeah. that. And no. isn't it good that you've got those different avenues now to do it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting that you um, just, just you brought up the, the, the magazine and, uh, and that's been a, a, a big part of your, um, I, I guess, legacy. I, I, when I started uh, photography and wanting to learn Photoshop um, and and the digital sort of techniques. Your magazines are where I got that from. Like I learned about curves from the article that you wrote in Better Photography about adjusting curves, and yeah. I was blown away. I thought this is great. Yeah. You know, this damn is- Google, damn Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 um, you know, it's 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 um, you, you've been a, a real pioneer of you know, pushing this stuff forward. And I think that, you know, not just in an Australian context, but in, a, in an international context, you were, you know, really at the edge of publishing where this stuff um, was going. And, um, and I think we've got a lot to thank you for that. And you continue to do that. And, um, and you're not apologetic about it, nor should you be. You've inspired a lot of people um, with, with um, where they've gone, with their photography, with their post-processing, with their ideas, um, you've turned some people off as well. <laughs> I can think of I can think of a couple of people off the top of my head that yeah, were so you know, sh- shaking their fist at you right now for stretching the Western Arthurs. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but, <laughs> that's, and, that's, and that's I should enough. know that that stretched shot of the Western Arthurs is in a hotel somewhere in Hobart at the moment. It's a big two metre print. Oh, right. Right. Oh, there'll, be, <laughs> there'll be people vomiting <laughs> people into their cups of tea. <laughs> I, I can assure you, but uh, that's that's great. No, it's uh, you know, I'm just referring to something that controversial that happened when Peter went decided to go for a big long bushwalk and came back and showed us a few of his shots. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but certainly you 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 are at that at that edge and have been at that edge, and you've you've been the um, the sort of um, the you know one of the educators towards that sort of. Um, work so um thank you for that and, uh, and you. I think no, I've, that... I've just been having fun so uh, it's good yeah <laughs> i just jump in and ask a question before what sounds like we're going to be moving on yes yeah so um my question is from 2019 if you look at every winner from 2014 to 2019 you've got very diverse range of winners and anyone that says that you can't win it with purest kind of photography just look at what adam gibbs entered the year that he won mm. Um, And you can even jump on YouTube and watch him taking a lot of those photographs so you can confirm it for yourself because he shows the before and after a lot of the time. (laughs) Um, The last two years, there's been kind of an influx of uh, very stylized portrait photographs that are taken in a very similar way. uh, Yeah. You've got the strong foreground leading to some sort of point in the background. Are you concerned that your competition might create a feedback loop where people see these photographs and think those are the photographs that I need to be taking and entering? Or do you have plans through your marketing and how you communicate about the photography that you represent to kind of show some of those more natural photographs that are made 101 so that you're encouraging people to enter so that in future you can still have those really diverse and unusual kind of um, folios that have amazing work that ends up winning? 
Yeah, I, I, so is it my role to decide what the top 101 look like or is that the role of the judges? And I'm very clear on that. It's not up to me to make that decision. Have I noticed that there are a whole lot of photos that look a lot like Max Reeves' um, photos? I mean, and again, <laughs> yeah. Max got second this year, so yeah, we can't um, complain about that. Um, and then if I go back and I look at the history of the professional photography, the AIPP's professional photography award, so because I can look at that for 40 years and I've had this same criticism you know, or I've been part of that criticism or I've received it or I've watched it and it just sort of goes in cycles. We used to complain yeah. that, you know, to get an award, you needed to make your photograph small, dark and moody with a bit of blur in it when those in the days of the dark room. And, you know, then you know, 20 or... years later, we were doing the same thing digitally. <laughs> you know, so it, it, I think that the judges will start to say, God, there are an awful lot of those bloody vertical ones last year. You're going to have to really impress me to, for me to give you a high score this year. Look at squareals. Um, you know, the aerial abstract. And, you know, we were very worried at APA because, um, you know, if we go back, what, five years ago, six years ago, you know, every, every, all you had to do was go up in a plane, stick your camera out and take a shot and you got a silver award. <laughs> then again, if you were into baby photography, all you had to do was put a row of flowers around in a circle and a bub in the middle and you get a silver award for that as well. So, yeah, I'd get into trouble for that one, won't I, Matt? But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> There's no one to get in trouble but, but, anymore. <laughs> That's true. So there are these issues that um, come, and I think I, I just I just let it go. I, I'm I'm sure that the judges are looking at it because they will often talk to me and they say, oh, geez, we had a lot of that or whatever. And I say, well, yeah, you're, you're, you're the judges. I've got those same four judges every year. And then the winner, so we stop them from winning twice in a row, the winner becomes a, a judge uh, as well. And so there's a certain continuity of thought which allows them to, so what we're really doing is creating this contemporary lineage of landscape photography. It's just one narrow view. There are all sorts of people who are shooting landscapes only with iPhones and um, you know, smartphones, whatever it is, you know, they're completely different areas. I would also suggest, well, I'm probably wrong. There are a lot more younger photographers entering the landscape competition than entered the AIPP awards, for instance. And so it is really good to see the younger photographers coming through and uh, being involved in a competition in some way. Maybe Absolutely. that's the way us old dinosaurs get to reach them. Yeah, well, my, our friend um, Ben Mays, who's been on the show, um, very early 20s um, and um, had five in the top 202. So, you know, um, that, that speaks to that. So definitely. All right. Well, yeah, well, I, think, I, I appreciate, I think where Matt was, questions I was asking was a little bit about, because the role and influence you could have is, is what you present from an advertising point of view and which you do have choices around in terms of that breadth, I guess. Um, like I watch, and something I've really appreciated about, uh, to go back to it again, I've watched the natural landscape guys just go through maybe they might have hundreds of images that they're going through from way, way, way backlogs that are nowhere near any of the other winners. And yet week by week, and they're showcasing them through their Instagram through the whole year to, to really celebrate the breadth and depth and, and uniqueness and, um, and that of, of the type of entries that have come in. And it's quite amazing what they've chosen and quite thoughtful how they've done that. I'll probably put that to Tim a lot. I think he's, he's that kind of man. He, he really, he really is happy to give as much time and, and love to the underdog as he is to um, to anybody at the top. And 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 I think you've done that with the 101 and most especially this year with the 202. Having sort of, I've made the 101, I think seven years, but I've probably had three or four sitting in that 202 for all those years that no one's ever seen. And yes. this is the first year I didn't get it when you introduced it, but but I love the fact, I think it, it brings a sense of joining. It brings a wider exactly. sense of community. Yeah. It gives a beautiful breadth of celebration. It makes it feel more accessible and less kind of exclusive. And, and I really love that you've done that this year, Peter. And I, I, I don't know how much thought you put behind that, but um, I think it's a very positive and significant step. Well, it's just it, because the competition has become more popular. I mean, when we, our first year, or first couple of years, we might've had 1500 odd entries. So top 100. And now we've got four and a half thousand. And I'm just looking at all of these amazing photographs, which nobody else is going to get to see. So that was behind the idea is, um, you know, and now what, once I've got the database worked out to get the top 101, I can just change that number to 202. And so uh, it, 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 there's about a day's work getting it all together, but it's, it's worth doing. And it, it, I guess it would be a shame too, because you obviously you can't enter twice um, in subsequent years. So those, 
you know, that people only, you, you can only see them once any, any other way. So, you know, why not, why not show what the best of the world's doing? So it does make a lot of sense and everyone loves a pat on the back. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know, I'd like, like to make it. Back, um, that was very kind. <laughs> yeah. Like a, I think there's a commentary to be had it and we might do another show about it another time is there's, there is a certain culture that evolves around different um, organizations and different competitions. And, I haven't been around as long as Peter, but I've been around long enough to to just see some of the trends, like what you would enter in the head-on awards and landscape mm-hmm. compared to compared to the Appers or compared to the internationals. It's like I remember I was lucky enough to get second, and the image that won was a giraffe lying down on the grass on a blue tarp, and I was like, "What?" And I, was just, and I still to this day I have no idea what happened to that competition. I have no idea what to enter. I have no idea what's going to happen. And I don't necessarily feel that way in these awards because there, there is a sense of stylization that filters through and really beautifully refined, incredibly elegant and, and fast, fantastical feel that, that does drift through a lot of the imagery. And it's a great skill to do that. And I know because I don't know how to do it myself. <laughs> when I see it done well, I, I nod my head and go, geez, that is just quite exquisite. Um, but how, how do you feel? Do you feel like that's a fair comment, Peter? Like there was, you know, dark, gloomy and moody and appers for quite a few years. And you've seen that cycle go as you spoke to from early film days back to modern times. And I think it's up to you as the viewer to maybe look through the past galleries, make your choices, read through the category descriptions and the different kind of rule structures and see if that fits your work and where you want to sort of um, celebrate or, or, or put your work up against your other peers in that kind of context, because different competitions have a different context. Where I do think there's a little bit of responsibility is the transparency of those contexts. And, you know, if you're claiming to be the International Landscape Talk of the Year, you know, well, you know, there's, there's people that would be like, well, wait a minute, um, what does that actually mean? And, and, you know, is that an even, and, and we use that word, which is quite interesting, a little bit judgmental, is it an even playing field, you know, when we decide that your tools of choice and timing and understanding of light and focal length are any less or more of a skill than, than your post-production skills in terms of weighing up against each other, you know, like, so, so that's another conversation permutation itself. But the main argument I see between um, images on a singular point of view that are out there that has said, you know, this is a great landscape image is whether people are transparent about whether it's a composite image where it's a sky from three years ago and it's a foreground from another shoot somewhere else. And, you know, just, just being honest and, and open about that. And I think, you know, that's something I think to be present to because I think it takes away anybody's argument, you know, cause here it is, it's clear as a bell and it's just your choice about whether you enter this or not. And I don't think you're not doing that, but I do think it's 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 part of that conversation that's on the edge of and that grey line that constantly people are the people out on the you know the keyboard warriors they might not have read the rules properly or understood how transparent it is or or they get a bit put off by the the absolute polished level of post production that's applied to a lot of the images in the top hundred, which which there are and it's done masterfully well. Um, Do anyone have any sort of wider thoughts about that cultural conversation and that responsibility around transparency? I think you need to look at um, Frank Hurley and um, uh, uh, Sir uh, Hubert um, Wilkins and some two of Australia's uh, most amazing photographers and how they um, had completely different viewpoints. You know, one was right into the the art, the showmanship, etc. The other was just straight record photography, didn't even care whether people knew he took the photo or not. Totally polar differences. And I think that's what we've got to celebrate is mm. that there isn't, photography is a language and mm. you can write poetry or you can write a scientific dossier. It's still language that we're using. And for us to have these conversations is much better when you've got a glass of red wine, maybe I'll <laughs> get one. And, and you know, because yeah, the, the conversations will keep on going. In terms of transparency for our awards, Every time I'm writing there, I, I say there are two basic schools, you know, the purists and the fakers. Um, I'm being flippant there. Um, you know, the people who use their imagination, the people who use their exertions to take the photos. It's not right or wrong. It's your choice. And the judges, they're not silly. They have the ability to pick and choose and they pick them all. And so that's why, you know, so I don't, I don't know whether we have to be any more transparent than that in this context. If I'm giving my photos to, I was looking through some photos the other day where I'd given a photograph of uh, the Pilbara to Australian Geographic 
and they they ran it as a double page spread. And I said, oh, listen, you guys, that photo has been heavily manipulated. I mean, they're black clouds, now they're white clouds and a little bit red, et cetera. I said, it's not, it's not authentic. And they said, no, it's all right. We want it to, we want, want to use the photo for what the world is going to look like after Armageddon's come through. And so it's actually perfect for it. So I think that that was important to say to that audience, yes, this is an illustration more than a straight photograph, but that's in the context of Australian Geo. Whereas yeah. in a photography magazine, well, you know, they've been faking it um, you know, since, since photography started. So if you, if you believe that all photos are what you see, have a good life anyway. <laughs> Matt, you had a, too much more time on, on this um, to, because we did go through, but I, I believe Matt yeah. had something you wanted to say. Yeah, I think after that, we, we go and put the money where the, where the mouth is and have a look at these amazing images. Mm, and we can oh, definitely I've... pick up this topic later too. I think it's a, a really... Yeah, it's been a really good, healthy conversation. Yeah, I think. I've really enjoyed Thanks, it. Thanks, everyone. It's been fantastic. Mm. Yeah, well, I think I can wrap it up in an amusing way, and that is last time that I entered an international landscape photographer i was lucky enough to be in the top 101 and i feel very bad for the photographer that shared the spread with me because my picture was a fairly natural photo however it was a composite of a lot of rubbish and um i couldn't actually enter that photograph even though it was quite purist in terms of what was captured and how in natural kind of competitions i couldn't enter in nat geo or any of those other places so sometimes there is um, work that is telling quite a pure message or important work that can't go into those purest competitions um, that aren't necessarily edited to death. And sometimes these broader competitions give those kind of places space to be. Um, and I'm also really disappointed that the winner this year wasn't just four pictures of trash. So I obviously haven't influenced <laughs> anyone at all. Well, speaking of the Not winner, we'll, maybe we can um, uh, move on now to... Oh, uh, it's well, actual, it's well time. The, we, so we what probably... we're going to do is go through the book, um, which is um, a beautiful present, uh, beautiful publication put together by Peter. I don't, not sure if you still do it the same way back when I got my book, Peter, but it's a, it's an incredible... Um, yeah, book. proudly um, printed by Memento. Oh, Pro, yeah, yeah. And well, uh, the, all the category and prize winners get a copy of the book and it will be available for sale as a hard copy and uh, so for those of you who appreciate paper um, keep, keep an eye out we'll be making announcements in another week or two well, having yeah, having flipped through in, in person uh, many many of those books it's it's not just any publication it uh, is verbally done and it's probably one of the best of its of its kind in the world in terms well, of how well it's kudos produced. to my wonderful wife Kathy who uh, does the design so uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's why it looks yeah. so one of the one of the reasons of course kudos goes to all of the amazing photographers whose mm. photos are in there mm. and, and, and to Memento as well they oh, do yeah. yeah let me and Jeffrey amazing every page if you, if you want a if you want a good book print, it's amazing yeah. yeah if you want a if you want a good photographic book of your own work um, definitely go and see. Memento Pro. Um, if you're in Australia, I'm not sure if they're international or not. Peter, do you know? They don't uh, ship internationally at this stage. Oh. So, and that's been a challenge for us with the book, but we're looking at international options at the moment. So, I think yeah. we'll have a solution shortly for that. So, for those yeah. of you who are in Australia, you'll be able to order and Memento will deliver. If you're outside of Australia, we will have a solution this year, which will be easier and cheaper than the solution we had last time. The thing that kills us in Australia is posting it out of Australia. Yeah. So Australia, being a small player, when they negotiate the postal rates internationally, this is how someone explained it to me, who knows if it's right, but I guess we're just doing this on social media, so it doesn't have to be fact-checked. But basically they said Australia is not very good and uh, not able to negotiate good rates. So it might cost a dollar to send something from America here, but to send it back will cost us 10. So that's just yeah. how life is apparently. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll start off with the um, roll, please. I think Peter was saying earlier that he's guaranteed to have one photo in every every uh, book. So that's, <laughs> that's the um, judges' photos up yeah. the back. Uh, oh, right, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> More than that too. Um. So um, the uh, maybe Atec uh, was so um, enthusiastic about the win and just ecstatic. You know. Um. So uh, yeah. And, tell us and, about him, Peter. What you, What do you know about him? Well, only through emails and, you know, because I sent, uh, he's, he, you know, when you read the article, but basically he's, uh, uh, I think he was in, 
some sort of marketing and he just got out and moved into uh, going to different places and got into photography. And the photos, if you flip over to the next couple of pages, are in Cappadocia. Well, some of them are in this one here, for instance, I know for sure is in Cappadocia, which is in the heart of um, uh, Turkey. Now, I, I don't know how much of that is post-production and um, how much of it is real. I've been to Cappadocia. That looks like Cappadocia, but the real pointedness of those little mounds there, that looks a little bit exaggerated. So I, and, and, you know, I've looked at his file and I, I, don't, I can't really tell you yes or no as to whether that's a composite or just put together. So uh, one of these days I'll ask him, but uh, at the moment it just makes a good question. Well, if he can't tell, it also means he's done it very well. So that's, exactly. that's, why, exactly. that's why he's first place. So Yeah, and I think given the ethos of this competition, we don't need to be questioning each photo, okay. whether it's a composite or not. But if there is a single frame that stands out uh, to you, Peter, then, then um, acknowledge it, I suppose. But um, we're not going to question every photo. No, 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 no. But I, it was just a question that I had because yeah. I had been, been there. there. Yeah. Oh, I've yes. been there two or three times and I've never... Gotcha seen this but um yeah you know, atec does go for long walks and takes his gear and all that so and being a local and living there he's obviously done it far more thoroughly than me and my you know two or three day stays and to to get first place peter is it um what, what's the criteria in terms of so, the so the way we we do it we, we the judges score and it's a numerical basis so five five judges score the uh, percentage and that gives you the top 101 now, if you've got a photo in the top 101, we look at your top four scoring photos, whether the others are in the top 101 or not. And we take the 10 portfolios with the highest aggregate, and then they are sent to the judges to score again. So the person who won may only have one photo in the top 101, but the other three get, get them to get into the, the game, so to speak. Mm, and so, uh, and then... This judging here, it's not done on scores. It's done on the number of points. You know, you know, each judge gets to give a, a certain number of first, second, third, et cetera, and then we work it out from there. Mm -hmm. For the photographer, so this is for the photographer, and you need four photos to become a photographer on the basis that um, I see so many amazing photos I wish I'd taken on uh, Facebook and Instagram that, you know, but then you never see any other photos by these photographers. And so there's an, there's a, I guess, a premise out there that some people say, oh, that's just a lucky photo. Sorry, Luke, I realise that you only won the photograph uh, a few years ago. But <laughs> so the idea is that we have four photographs. And so it, it can't be a, a fluke that you've got four good photos and you become the photographer. Then we go to the best photograph of the year and that's in the top 101 but we take the top 20 of them and we go out to the judges and we say pick first second or third because you know people can have two cups of coffee three cups of coffee during you know they're judging four and a half thousand photos over a number of days it you know it, things can change and so we're just saying here are the top 20 just reassess and work out which should be first second and third and that's how we choose the uh, the, the photographer the photograph of the year Cool. So there is a bit of curation or at least a, a review process there rather than it being straight up on the scores. So that's, that's, yeah, that's there, is, there is for yep. the prizes and similarly for the, uh, the special prizes that we have and uh, the, the, the prize that the, the special categories like that, well, we'll get onto them anyway. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about them in a couple, mm. of, in a couple of pages if necessary. So Peter, the, it's, still, it's, it's, still an, an, it's still an individualist sort of behind closed doors process. There's no collective conversation about it. It's just, they rejudge it on their own in their own time. The, the, the own initial is certainly judging it all on their own. That's right, online. Yep. But the final process is that sort uh, of we, we have it. We, it um, we do if it's necessary, but the gotcha. initial score is just straight. And then I look at the results. And I mean, I have to say this year that four out of the five judges gave ATEC the first prize. So there was oh, no wow. need to have a further conversation. Yeah. But right. sometimes yeah. when it's much closer, then yes, we go back. Um, in the last couple of years, it's been, you know, what they've been reasonably decisive. In earlier years, it's sometimes been a, um, not a, a struggle, but it's been a process to get the result out. Also, so is, it, there, is there 20 folios of four as well to go for the photographer of the year as opposed to the individual? No, 10, 10 folios yes. of um, four, four and 20 yeah. individual shots. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Has anyone got any comments for the 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 four from the first place at all? Um, well, it's kind of this partly why I was asking about the process because, um, you know, as as Peter's aware more than probably anyone on the planet, you know, when, when you 
when you view a, a, a body, a, a series of images together, there's, there's a certain psychology of, of that can shift in your mind when you see them together, as opposed to judge separately and individually. Mm. That's why I was a little bit curious about. And, and that's a real challenge, Paul, because if you put 10 photos in, you have no control over which are going to be which your four that's top four be. Uh, yeah. yeah, And yet there's a, there's a great continuity of, of total balance and control and those triangular structures sort of r ripple through this sort of series mm. quite, quite beautifully as highlight features sort of all the way through. Very similar, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's they're similar kind of format, you know, there's, there's a lovely kind of vertical feel to them. And there's a very nuanced sort of tonality that, that weaves through them all um, quite beautifully, particularly in the way the sort of mid contrast and shadow areas are handled. Yeah. Um, Matt, have you got any commentary about the, the set here? There's one. Yeah, um, beautifully handled. I mean, obviously there's some editing involved, but it's been done at a master's kind of level and it's not something where it becomes the focus of the image you're too taken by the subject matter itself. Like the shadow detail in this photograph in particular is a stunning to have all of that texture on the trees and all that kind of mm. stuff and then a clear point of view as to, you know, taking you through those trees, guiding you into the distance. It's uh, been really exceptionally handled. I think to, to have that level of texture all the way through the image and yet it's not overpowering and you're still beautifully pulled through the image by the highlight that, but again, you're not jerked through, you, you're just kind of led through and you've got lots of places to rest your eyes and explore and, and be present to on, on the way through and on the way back out. It's yeah. The way that tone range has been handled is magnificent. Mm -hmm. What's, um, a lot can I just put in a, a quick comment? Sorry, just for people who are viewing this at home, what we're looking at here is probably not, well, it's not high resolution. Um, this is a 144 pixel per inch uh, PDF that's being downloaded. I'm looking at it on a 4K screen. You really need to go and download the PDF from the website mm. or even better buy a book to understand mm. how good the photos look. So when you see us waxing lyrical about this, either that or, or reduce the size of your screen so you're looking at them a little bit smaller and that might give it a little bit more clarity. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Just, 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 um, that, that's something I, I'll, I'll let you jump in after, Nick. Um, just quickly, an acknowledgement of that. I feel like, uh, is, is it 3,000 pixels is the entry kind of size from memory? We ask for 5,000 pixels. Uh, for the actual... Uh, we, the reason we ask for or? that is because we can produce an A3 size book. Mm. But they're okay. judged at 3,000 and then you, you need they're to provide judged that. At, um, they're judged at a number of uh, resolutions, but the judges can download the full res file to look at it on the screen. Oh, gotcha. Right. Because that, to me, that's that's one of the things that I particularly love about this competition is some competitions don't do that. They're, they're literally like, oh, you have to keep it under one megabyte. It's only 1,000. And I'm just like, how is that doing the image justice? Yeah, yeah. Possibly... Yeah go into the corners and, and really get a sense of how, how well the, you know, the sharp things been handled through the frame and all those kind of things. And, and they don't want to do it because of the extra data and, and volume that they have to handle, for instance. But, but I feel like you, you, you're giving breathing room to the, to the ut utmost high end caliber of how it can be presented digitally. And I, and I just want to do acknowledge it for that, Peter, because I know that's going to, that's a bit of a headache on the back end with, with the size and the data that you're yeah, dealing with as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was going to ask um, Paul as to what size the entries were. Um, I know from experience, um, um, Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year Award asked for quite small file sizes, or they have in the past. Yeah, and um, I know when I was I know when I was viewing the exhibition um, in person, physically viewing it at the South Australian Museum, uh, the one that I, I went to. Um, there were a couple of prints in that that didn't really stack up to how they st stacked up um, on the screen at the lower resolution. You know, the main and cause of that is um, a lot of the wildlife images are taken heavily cropped. Um, so you can enter yeah. it heavily cropped, but then yeah. it's a bit of an uh oh moment where you need the high res file to, to put an exhibition print up. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, true. And um, and they, they obviously say, you know, they're, you need to submit a, a file of a certain size for printing, but it was clear viewing a couple that weren't actually wildlife or landscape okay. genre ones. Um, there are a couple that had some post-production issues that weren't visible on the screen and weren't, wouldn't have been vis visible to the judges. 
that were actually, um, there were a couple of problems with them. When you looked at them up close and you went, okay, well, if they'd had a larger file to view for the judging, they probably wouldn't have included those in the, the top 10 of that category, just based on the quality of the, the output. Um, it's a very different judging process to the oh, yeah. competition. It's so not, it's, it's not really... Not yeah. yeah, it's not really a, a, a criticism as such, but mm. I'm just saying that's what's good about this competition, that we can be confident when we're viewing the lower resolution stuff on the screen that the judges have had the ability to, to really have a look at not just the aesthetic, but also the technique and the mastery of the post-production. Mm. Um, well because, said. you know, this competition is about post-production as well as other things. And if... If it looks great on Instagram, as you would know, it doesn't necessarily mean that that'll that'll translate to a you know an A2 print. Um, so it's it you know this is a, a great aspect of this that if you are you know really competent at your post production, <coughs> excuse me, then this is a competition that um, would really suit you from it from just a technical aspect, let alone an aesthetic one. Is that, is that quite got... deliberate on your part, Peter? So, sorry, sorry. Is that quite deliberate on your part? Because it, yeah, no, it, it is. That is quite different. Thanks, Nick, from... for pointing it out. But I, as I was saying a little bit before, of course, Nick, is that that's for me. That's for you. I mean, we're that generation, and yet a lot of the guys who are entering are probably not printing. I don't know about ATEC and the others, but you know, I know for a lot of them, it's it's sort of new. And um, a few comments I've had: Oh, we're possibly going to have to ramp up our technique and get a little bit better. But I I wonder. Well, you know. Are we going to have, how long are we going to have print? How long is print going to be there? Matt's there going, God, Peter, I've just got a gallery. Print's got to last for a little longer yet. <laughs> you know, all these sort of things. But the, it's, it's just one of those questions. And I, I mean, I will always process for print, but mm, I right. just have to acknowledge, well, the world that we're living in, this is a contemporary award. You know, how long will that be, be relevant? And I hope it'll be relevant forever. That's my mm. view, mm. but I, I don't know whether it will. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I think um, from a gallery point of view, everyone's got blank walls or they put yeah. something up to not have blank walls. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it might get to the stage where one day we all have digital picture frames and we have some subscription service or something that we feed images into our frames on the wall and it's all done digitally and presented in that way. That's a possibility and there's some... Definitely. technology that's already going in that direction but uh hopefully it'll stick around for a while yet and there is nothing like seeing a photograph in print oh, i'm with pretty you, hard Matt. to collect v that viva too. the strength mate we were the revolution viva la print you can't really collect a digital file like um well you can do it get an nft i suppose but, oh. um, yeah, but you yeah, can't right. really you know there's nothing tangible there but anyway we've, we've done a lot of chatting and we probably should go through some images or else we'll well, yep. um, that'll yep. be the whole show. Let's um, cycle through. So, yes. um, show number two. Actually, look at the images. To, given, that, <laughs> given that he was first place, any any final comments for ATAC there or just move on? All right. Oh, we'll great, just... great work. Let's yeah, move on. Yeah, <laughs> well yeah, All right, Max, um, second place. Peter, what would you just say, because Max has been consistently up the top end of this competition for quite a while now, what, what would you say are the characteristics or qualities in his work that, that help it rise to the top? Well, certainly um, highly stylized, um, you know, looking for the light, the emotion, the mood and all of that sort of, you know, it beautifully exercised. Um, a little bit of a, a formula approach in the way that they're put together. And I say that because I use the same formula for a lot of my photos. It's not a criticism, it's an observation, but you just can't argue with Max's uh, stuff. It's uh, beautifully put together. And I like the fact that he's brave enough, you know, like the sheep there, for instance, it is a little, I mean, when you open up the full res file, et cetera, there is detail all the way through, but you know, he's, he's leaving part of the image there for our imagination as well. What do you mean by that, Peter? Well, it's he's not just presenting. It's it's not you know it, it's he's, he hasn't got a couple of big hot lights behind us blasting the crap out of the sheep so that they're nicely lit. He's allowing the ambience, the, the light from yeah. behind in the distance, come through and just you know stroke the backs of the sheep, give them a little pat and say there there, make me a jumper, all that sort of stuff. There's there's a lot more mood. It's 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 not clinical in any way. I mean, there are some you know you can go and get a, a large format camera and take a very you know, take a Dombrovskis style photograph, 
which is just elegant in its execution and its composition, well, then you can go like Max is doing and he's just, he's totally into mood and atmosphere, isn't he? Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. We'll move on to... Anyone, anyone uh, else have a comment? Oh, yeah. Oops. No. Yeah. I'd certainly love this lead in with this glacier. It looks fantastic. Yeah. Absolute yeah. master of, of mood and atmosphere, Max, yes. so consistently in all sorts of different contexts. Mm. Mm. Brilliant. All right. And Andrea. Do you know anything about Andrea? Andrea? Yeah. No, I don't. Uh... Italy. I'll, I'll let you guys talk a little bit more. I mean, uh, yeah. No worries. No worries. Yeah. I mean, I mean, depending on what view you're in, you could be, you know, you could physically just put your hand up if you have a comment that you want to say. Um, otherwise, we could just let the work sit for a little bit of time rather than having to honestly ask. Matt? I'm very jealous of his locations. Mm. Yeah. I reckon. Oh my oh, God. There's a lot to be said about all four images, but I'll just point out something a little bit more subtle, and that is the tiny bit of light that's um, on the glacier on the left-hand side of the panoramic. And that's oh, yeah. very deliberate in terms of being able to pull your eye to that area and take in the mountains and that kind of thing before you travel back through the glacier to that building. So um, it may be it may not look visually consistent um, in terms of, you know, everything's lit the same way or whatever, but it's very deliberate uh, compositionally to have that there. That would also strike me as the sort of conditions where if you're going out, you wouldn't be particularly inspired. So it's kind of cool to end up with a shot that um, actually works so well. Yeah. Yeah. That really creates that, that sense of um, dynamism to moving your eye right to left. Otherwise you'd, you'd have, you'd, you'd sort of, you'd be a bit, sort of a missing point, I think to some extent. It's always quite brave, I think, doing broad panoramic sort of scenes and trying to keep the level of interest consistent all the way through the frame and, and such a wide aspect. And and there's just a lot of richness, I think, all, all the way through. You know, there's a lot more sort of breathing room, say, in the foreground and on the bottom there. Um, and again, that masterful kind of tonality in the top right, sort of all the way through frame, you know, like anyone who knows anything about compositions where you're shooting into light like that, that's... Uh, that is, that is a great skill set mm. to be able to express uh, that that type of exposure that you'd, you'd be present to in a camera technically and in such a balanced and and subtle and, and graceful sort of format. And again, the tonality between the foreground and the background on the right too, that's that's not an easy thing to um, to to create successfully and it's really consistent, consistently all through the frame. Such beautiful leading lines and texture. Mm. Mm, big fan of um, Astro June shots. Always, um, yeah, just really well executed there with the lead in taking you to the Milky Way core. Yeah, we, we don't get, there's not much of that in our backyard down here either, Peter. So, uh, yeah, yeah, a little beautiful. bit jealous. All right. Well, um, let's keep moving. Um, so, the photograph of the year, uh, Tanmay, is it pronounced? And... Yeah, do you want to speak to us with your thoughts about this, Peter? Is that, is that oh, okay? Well, just a bit of uh, Tamay's background on it in that it is a, a composite, but he'd been to this location and he just noticed the way the, the car lights lit up the fog from underneath. And it, it's when you read the book, he, give, he explains it much better than I am here. Uh, but he couldn't get the, the comet wasn't going to be in exactly the right spot. So he shot the comet and put it above you know, that, that particular landscape. So it's all in the same area, but... It is a composite image. Oh, it's good to see that it was, um, you know, that was a, in the intention of probably creating something like that. It just didn't quite work out how, how you know, exactly. So, yeah, it's um, really beautifully seen. Yeah, it looks the kind of guy that would, would spend a lot of time planning a shot like that as well. So he probably appreciates it as much as anyone probably could. Well, I also appreciate the adaptability to, like, noticing uh, conditions and then, like, for example, the, the car lights and then then focusing on that, whereas, you know, the photographer may have had a, a different... Um, uh, goal in mind initially and so I, i'm a big believer of sort of working to the strengths of the particular scenario and and looks like that's what he's done there and and benefited very sweetly from that hmm. and it's it's a bit of a risk you know you don't know where that inversion is going to kind of finish your end and you don't necessarily have a lot of say about how long it lasts or how quickly it moves up or down and and to and to get that kind of balance of where he has where, where there's that hint of sort of depth and a little bit more on the right hand side of the frame of, of what the landscape may be laying underneath and letting just the shape of the clouds themselves, you know, add the mystery of what they could be uh, through the rest of the frame, I think is, is really, really lends a lot of majesty to the scene. And 
again, there's a there's a certain thirds kind of balancing between the the, the visual space and, and and breadth of the of the foreground and, and, and mm. the upper sky that that gives it this this wonderful almost like a dissection, and yet there's a pathway to to walk through all of them um, from one point to the other. You got any thoughts about this one, Matt? Uh, well, a few thoughts. Um, the light in general has been really well placed or photographed. And when I say placed, I also mean, you know, when you're there in person composing the scene. So you're led between these three different light sources um, to take in the rest of the scene. But also there's a lot of restraint in how the sky has been photographed as well. Very much so. Which is pretty nice. Uh, just lets that comet kind of sing by itself without, you know, blasting all of the stars or milky way or anything around it it just um, keeps it quite calming in a way for something that's so intense yeah it's such an event there probably was you know many many photos taken of the comet comet so so it's nice to you know um have one that still um struck the judges that way um given you know how, how big of an event it actually was i also a big fan of the fact that an astro shot actually uh took out that that area as well so it's always nice to see did, did, um, night photography doing so well did, did the comet miss us in the end i i think so I, I, have you seen that still here, I think it's about that's a documentary was you know, um yeah no um i think we're all good um all right any further comments don't look comments, up comments yeah he got, a, he got a parking ticket oh that's such a crazy shot. film <laughs> oh my god i'm reading yeah he said he got a parking ticket when he when he took the shots and he reckons it's the best 80 dollars he's ever spent so <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah there's a beautiful write up here about it all so oh um, i haven't read it oh brilliant yeah, yeah yeah so um do check that out all right we'll move on um i'm Marion county really, i used to live there we really yeah, don't right. have a lot of time to go through um all of the the ones here so we'll have to just try and um, just, um, just before we do do we do we because we don't have so long do we have a certain strategy that we all want to sort of agree to to because we're not going to get through everything so do we want to just give the work i'll give it a, i'll give it i'll change to the image i'll give a bit of time if anyone has anything that they would like to say then then just chime in and um we'll try and keep it okay, to 30 up. seconds or so we're still we're yeah. still on the prize winners so let's yeah. give them a little bit of time and yeah. then we'll we'll start yeah. flicking a bit quicker how's that sound yep yeah. sounds yeah. good to me all right um any comments for cedric shot here yeah beautiful all those people saying photoshop awards eat your heart out mm. Yeah, absolutely. I'd I'd like oh, yeah. to see this one in print um, and get a real sense of of the colour for itself, as opposed to seeing it on the screen, um, and 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 see that that those tones and how they interact in print. It's a beautiful beautiful aesthetic, and um, and it'd be something that would just look pretty damn special, I think, um, as a nice print. I sort of feel how remarkable it is that, you know, there's the, all those trees just on the top of the points of the hill as well. It's a, it's a really nice find to, mm. to have that sort of laid out that way. Um, obviously, the tree on the hill is a, a classic in landscape photography and to have multiple um, stacked there is pretty handy. So yeah, I, I was just picking up on Matt's comment. Matt, were you indicating that you thought it was a composite? No, I'm saying this is a very pure style of shot. Yeah. And I have... I haven't seen these trees personally, but I've seen them in other, other photographs. Well, I was so, going to say, there's you know, another photo in the book. They together. Yeah. Yeah. There's right. another photograph of the book. I think it's the same three trees. And oh, wow. uh, originally when we are going through the top 101, I reserve the right if there are, if a photographer has put in two photos of the same subject that are very subject. similar, we just take the highest scoring one and we let the other one go so we don't have repetition in the book. And I was about to disqualify one of these two, but they're different photographers. So <laughs> there, there you go. go. Oh, perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, a favourite for photographers, and I can very much see why. It's um, yeah, quite, yeah. quite a beautiful location. Yeah. Um, Freddie, yours next, Lucky. What was that, mate? Friend of yours next, Ben Good. Yes, Ben, yes, um, Adelaide boy, and we've been trying to get him on the show. Hopefully one day um, get him on. I absolutely adore his work, and it was um, really uh, exciting to see him score so well. Um, and he's he just puts out so much quality work and definitely, um, you know, it's good to see him get the recognition for that on an international stage. So um, well done, Peter, ben. Peter, what, what sort of score range are we looking at for the top three? Uh, it, it's academic because you know they they all scored eighty five point five or whatever it is higher to get into the top one hundred and one. But then for here we're taking the top twenty scorers 
And yeah, so Ben could have come first. He could have come nineteenth. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Just, just so but when yeah. the judges reassessed, he came third. That's all. That's all that matters. Mm. Yep. No, that's yeah, it. That's the way it works. Yep. yep. Brilliant. Yeah, and I think um I think it might be Lake Bonnie in South Australia, which is a, a really I've always wanted to get there. Um, uh, just a stunning, surreal location where you've got those dead trees just out of the water. Uh, like that. So, is that lichen uh, on there, or is it just? No, I think it'd be early light morning light. light. It would be my guess. Um, lit up in like a you know that sort of um, dawn sort of glow. Um, or that, that's that's what really ties the whole thing together. Is that mm -hmm. that orange and blue kind of perfect opposition of the color wheel? Mm. You know the the the. the the, the warm tones pull it forward and the blue tones pull you back. So it so really accentuates the, that sort of visual depth. Um, and it just has this sandwich kind of feel, this connection between the upper and lower parts of the image. And, um, and yet there's, a, there's this kind of balanced anchoring base by, by having that darker placement in the, in, in the bottom, that darker third. It's, um, so you're not just left floating in the ether. You've got somewhere to land your feet. Yeah. I think he's also handled it really well. I, I can see that there is a bit of land behind here. So um, to be able to create that separation uh, and that's um, been really hand, well handled to just to make sure that the, the trees do stay forward rather than the land sort of bringing them back like that. And so, Peter, are the, um, are the titles included in the judging at all? No. Yeah, I was, I was assuming as much. I just thought I'd double check. Beautiful. All right, any final comments on Reflector? Well yeah. done, Ben. Yeah, um, good stuff. You don't need a, a non-blue sky to be able to win an award. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. Fine point. Good on you, Ben. Beautiful. All right, moving along. Special award winners. Um, so we've got the monochrome award. What a, what a stunner. Just, just quickly, Peter, you didn't have special awards in the first year, did you? That that was a development. Yeah, I think so. Had, I think we've had special yeah, awards all the way through. And, all the way? I wasn't sure. I couldn't the, remember. The, the idea behind them too is that uh, Created for Life, uh, Glenn McKimmon, up the Central Coast here from Sydney, uh, a, they, he makes available a one-metre print of their photograph, um, which gets, you know, so we ship them all around the world. This one's going to Germany, as you can see. But again, the idea is, yeah, just some fun awards and uh, the judges get to pick what they think is the, the strongest monochrome. And um, we like to recognise the print as well. Mm. Oh, it's a magnificent monochrome. It just really stands out and no doubt would have to the judges to get it to this level it, it just uh, that and it really goes to show because this no doubt is a straight shot i you know i've got no doubt with that um but it just goes to show that you get reward for effort as well um that he would have to have gone out in in some fairly cold conditions after um after watching the weather very carefully and got to this location before that um, that frost had yeah, melted the away. Yeah. Um, it, and, you know, it really goes to show that um, you can get the reward for effort, and, uh, and this one's a prime example of it. Probably one, too, that, um, you know, you'd have, um, almost have to see the scene in monochrome to recognise the potential perhaps as well. So mm. um, that's that's really well um, done. In the, and obviously the fog in the background creating that um, depth as well is really helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Moving along, any final ones on that one? All right. Uh, what have we got? The amazing aerial. Do we know if it's the Iceland volcano? I, I um, don't know. I can't remember where the mm. location was. Uh, yeah, it's pretty yeah. likely, isn't it, given how popular that, that location has been? The, the location might yeah. be on the photograph in the top 101 because uh, we know okay. the location. Yep. Yeah. yep. Oh, you did too. Yeah, okay. Yep. Um, I, I'm I'm curious how many drones have lived and died around that volcano <laughs> in the last year. Yeah. You know? Oh my god! Absolutely. I think you guaranteed 100,000 k views on YouTube or more if you sacrifice your drone and still able to retrieve the, <laughs> yeah, you'll make the footage. Yeah, that's otherwise. right. For yeah. like instant instant advertisement money, I think I think yeah. that's what people are doing for in the end. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, it's a pretty um very pretty dramatic. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, if that, I wonder if that could have been shot in the daytime and as well, you know, and it's just either been darkened out or, or just that, you know, that the darker, you know, volcanic rock around it was it was enough with that um, huge highlight to to pull that down. I'm a little bit curious. Whatever the case, um, night photography um, it, from the air is always a, a, a challenge. So it's um, obviously very well executed to do that. Mm. Well, I just I'm just wondering if it is. That's my point. I'd yeah. Be, okay. Yep. Yep. 
It's got a lovely tree shape, hasn't it? It could almost be the... A, a tree of light, the, the, the branches and the roots, etc. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, yeah. there's an amazing delicacy to something that's actually really energetically so violent. I feel mm. like you could find something if you looked hard enough in, in this sort of area too, in, in terms of a, a face or a, a pattern or something like that as well. So. Yeah, or a very angry squid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's yeah, well done. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Beautiful. All right, moving on. We've got the Snow and Ice Award. Oh. Well, it's very yeah. delicate, isn't it? Yeah, Beautiful layering. Isn't, isn't it yeah. great that um, I, I can probably just um, applaud the judges, I guess, is that, you know, we're, we're often told when we enter photo competitions, you've got to have impact, you've got to knock them between the eyes and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Whereas, you know, within, within our top 101, there are lots of, there's lots of space for the quieter moments to come to the top. And that's another reason for having 101 is that, you know, we don't just have to have that hit them in the eyes winning shot. We've got time for you know, stuff which is really beautiful and subtle like this. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we're, what's particularly masterful to me, because it's a little bit brave in that re- in that regard, I think, Peter, but um, just the, the elegance of how subtle the, the tonal separation is and the colour between the hints of blue, the hints of yellow, the hints of sort of magenta and red up, up higher up, they're, they're really quite masterful and, and they're quite consistent about how beautifully they're handled, the way they encourage your eye to move around the frame almost unconsciously mm. because it's it's that it's that beautifully um that beautiful subtlety of how they're handled um, but it again it's been I'm, a temptation to make it monochrome but having that that extra bit of uh, color sort of helps to create that depth and quietly yeah. in between isn't it yeah. that's mm-hmm. that's one of its great appeals to me personally mm-hmm. awesome any any final comments all right we'll uh, move on we've got the night sky award well, Luke, you might want to talk to this one. Then well, I mean, I, I personally um, like having it tack sharp in this uh, front corner. This is clearly taken at a very wide uh, angle focal length. And so it's probably had considerable focus stacking to, to be able to create such a dramatic lead. And I'm assuming that those cracks really aren't that big <laughs> and um, it's really been drawn out. And, um, you know, to do that at night, um, you know, um, to focus stack at night is very hard because you can't really autofocus. Um, so, or you can put a maybe illuminate it and focus to that. But yeah, it's it's a challenge, and I I, I very rarely have patience myself. So I certainly can appreciate a, a beautifully uh, led in foreground like that. Um, and then obviously having the moon there, which has been treated well because you know your exposure times are going to be different for a moon versus the foreground. Um, given that the moon actually does blow out of those sort of foregrounds, I'm sure it's probably more of a long exposure in the foreground here. So yeah, it's just been handled really nicely. I think um, the 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 very subtle coup de grace is the positioning of the horizon that it's just positioned because you have to get probably quite low to get that sort of mm. little foreground, and yet they've just maintained enough height to to reach out and give it a sense of of, of space or as in spatial positioning in the wider landscape by including the, the horizon and, and the ocean in the background. It would have drive me crazy having this um, this part intersecting with the reflection. Um, my perfectionism would have, would have made that a challenge, but um, yeah, but, yeah, it's, but hard to, it's hard yeah. to have it all. Yeah, That's that's offset though by the continuation of the crack from the, uh, the bottom right uh, that goes through, but then it's picked up again with the, uh, the little peninsula there, but then mm. it continues on up into the top left with the lines or, you know, there, it's almost like continuation. And when you take... Yeah the crack that goes in the opposite direction that leads, uh, that ends sort of two thirds of the way up to the right, it gives a real cradling effect, even though it's offset, a cradling effect to that moon. Um, Mm, And I think it works absolutely beautifully well. Mm. Mm. And also the restraint not to have the reflection of the moon in the water. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that would have just complicated things. Yeah, it would have been very yeah. tempting, and Luke would have probably shot it that way. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I couldn't give up. I, I think I would have just not even bothered going that low. But um, I do agree with Paul, certainly having the horizon there. Um, looks like there's a bit of Belt of Venus there or something, so maybe just a very late sort of um, sunset or early sunrise. But, yeah, that certainly makes a massive difference, being able to see that and, and understand it's a seascape, essentially. Or, yeah, um, it ties the water yeah. Ties the elements of, of the water in the foreground beautifully with the background. Mm. It, gives, you know, it adds to that sense of continuity through the frame. Yeah, and it's such a small part of the frame, but how much difference that makes. Yeah. Yeah, and for the for the beginner or or uh, less experienced photographer, take heed of these sort of comments because it would be very easy to 
uh, intersect that uh, horizon with that little hump there or, or show too much horizon and, and lose the effect that, um, that we're describing here. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, the positioning for that sort of element is critical uh, when you're uh, doing compositions like this. I also just noticed the title being the puzzle, which I think is um, quite appropriate given the, the lines and things like that, which is, which is a nice touch too. All right, I'll move on to the next one. Um, we've got um, Chris from Australia, um, I think um, Adelaide based. Uh, well, it, it says that they had two by Design Adelaide. I think it's a bus shelter or something like that. Um, I, I read somewhere. So I think that's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Wow, I thought it would be something architectural. Well, I mean, I guess the bus. You can see a bit of a grate in here uh, or something. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's hard to wrap your head around yeah. otherwise, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really well seen. Beautiful. Mm. Well, I mean, that said, I mean, who, who, how many people in the world would, would approach a bus stop and come away with an image like that? that yeah. well, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't do it with a bus bus stop in uh, Sydney. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 wonder, like I wonder if there's people stop. over his shoulder or, or, you know, whether he had, we found a quiet moment or, you know, who knows what was actually going on contextually to actually mm. uh, capture this moment. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we can probably work out what it is uh, from the title, Peter, but the hand of man, I, what, what, were the, what were the criteria for, for this special award? Originally, we uh, had urban photography, but in the top 101, there weren't any urban <laughs> photographs. So uh, we did a little change and said the hand of man. And so basically, you know, it, like um, the, the, the photograph of the, uh, the winner, which had the, the, the photograph of the year, which had the headlights, well, that had the hand of man in that. That would have been eligible for this award as well. Uh, and it was just good the judges picked one which was architectural because mm. I, I love you know I love buildings in the landscape but uh, you know sometimes I wonder why the judges don't pick more photos with landscape with uh, buildings and landscapes but well, then again, um, I don't have any control over that so well, <laughs> the Pano Award certainly addresses that having a whole built category so it's um, yeah. it's a very different um, a very much more focused approach on that uh, what have we got now so we've actually got the top 101 here now. Um, and it might be worth just um, taking a moment to go through the names here and maybe um, comment on any maybe people that we we recognise in there and um, any. Well, other from Australian wise, Tom Tom Putt's got four, and I'd say he's he's probably over representing Australia <laughs> really beautifully well. Tom does remarkably well, consistently well. He uh, yeah. he's he, you know, he over the years he's he's always put in quite a number of entries. And he yep. always has three or four in, doesn't he? He does very well. Good on him. Yep. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he might be paying for, paying for Peter's beautiful jumper that he's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> no, my daughter bought that. <laughs> it's also uh, now, but you changed the rules, Peter, so that four, four maximum in the top 100. So yes, people that's, like right. Enough, that's right. Only people four. like Ignacio couldn't, couldn't go for 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think um, I ate it once, I think, in that show. Yeah, yeah. and the, the only out we had was um, if there were two photos that were very similar. Uh, but that that's, I think it was you know, three or four years ago we changed that just just so that we had, you know, we, we thought, well, if we're asking people to put four photos in for the portfolio, then they're, they're entitled to have four in the top 101. Mm. But this, what, Daniel? Um, Daniel Land Kai, from... You know, um, Kai's won before. Um, yeah. So there, there are a number of names that are starting to become uh, regulars, which is, which is great, but there's yeah. also a good um, selection of new names as well, which is also good. And as you can mm -hmm. see, Australia is there, but um, it's certainly not overrepresented. Yeah, I think Tom oh, probably oh, might have 50% or, or so of the Australian results, but it's nice to see Chandra um, getting a recognition for his great work in the top 101. He's... Um, I think he's based in, in New South Wales, Sydney area, and um, I've been following his work for quite a while. And um, yeah, it's really good to see him represented there. Also, as I mentioned, my, my good friend, Ben Mays, who we've had on the show um, to have one in there. And, and he had quite a few in the top uh, 200 as well. So he, he's done. I was, uh, well. I was sitting next to Scott Patelli when he took his, and I was also sitting next to Carolyn Chegg, which he, which he took both of hers. Yeah, and you missed out. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, I was thinking I should have been like directing the plane. There's shooting, the good shot, mate. pilot. <laughs> oh, I missed it. Yeah, yeah also yeah. a shout out to Sam Markham. He has some beautiful work. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Australia. Yeah. Obviously, Scott. Absolutely. Yeah, his, his entry was is, is remarkable. I absolutely adore that image. So, um, And you guys should probably give a, a shout out to Gavin Hardcastle. Maybe he'll um, put you on his photo trip at YouTube. Ah. 
Uh, yes, I can see. Yes, Gavin got one there, and and Adam Gibbs got one. The two uh, that play each other off on uh, Gavin's videos, and uh, yeah, good to see. I'm glad they both got in. Otherwise, we'd never hear the bloody end of it on Gavin's um, YouTube channel. So, uh, good day, Gavin. Hey, it, you don't know me, but <laughs> Georgie Popa, he seemed to do consistently well as also um, with a lot of a lot of aerial sort of work as well. Um, if I, if I forgot the right one from Rom Romania. Yeah, there, I mean, there is a few players that, that pop up, but I actually feel like when I look at these names, there's there's a lot I don't recognise, and it seems like there's a lot of fresh blood um, in the mix, which is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll hopefully we'll just go through now, and I think um just go for that formula I was saying. Have a have a quick look, and if anyone has any comments, um then um yeah, feel free to for mention, and and we'll see where we go. I think um it's going to be a challenge because I think the images are in alphabetical order, so um to go through them. Uh, no, 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 just the no, contents in alphabetical not. order. You can see the page numbers are all jiggly piggledy. Oh, so okay, perfect. perfect. Oh, well, there we go. No dramas. All right. So just so. The, the context would be we, we won't get through them all, so that'll just you encourage you to go through yourself. Yep. Um, yeah, absolutely. Deserve. So so I think the discussion we had has been really healthy and really wonderful, and you can apply that through in your own time with the images. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I think the conversation's more important to a certain degree and, and you know, we can critique images uh, anytime, but yeah, the understanding the competition and, and what it means is, is very important. So um, great comments. It's very poetic. Yeah. It's very, it's very simple. Um, like I, I've got mixed feelings about how it's cut off on the left-hand side like that, you know, it sort of adds a, a strange kind of, energetic to the dynamic of the whole frame but it also is what makes it a bit more interesting and far less static than it could be definitely got this major anchor here if that wasn't there it's sort of holding everything together i think almost mm. um yeah. scott oh yeah i was i think i was uh what are these birds they, Paulie? are they pelicans or something or yeah so we we, we did an exploratory trip up the, up at the gulf carpenteria together i i don't know scott that well but he, he headhunted me for someone to who would be dumb enough to come along with me to go in the middle of nowhere and fly around in planes <laughs> with their credit card. And uh, I was one of those sucker customers and and I hadn't been up there and, and um, goodness me, it's sort of between Arnhem land and, and Cape York, roughly that, that kind of area. And it's Scott had actually just been there a couple of months earlier in the wet season where, where the color palette was completely different. And he was really curious to go up there at, at the shift and transition into the dry and and it really was having looked over his shoulder at the body of work he produced a couple of months before and what we managed to get this time around, it was really different. Mm. And it surprised me the incredible diversity we got in, in, in yeah. just one flight and one landscape. Mm. Well, we've um, got a couple it, of shows on that one, Paulie. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, that's yeah. Right. You want to look back on, yeah. um, you, you did yours about, um, you know, your around the Australia trip and Scott also had some commentary on that. So let's, yeah, oh, so definitely yeah, follow point. that up. It would have been part of that whole trip. I certainly appreciate a nice um, lead into the corner um, like that and, and also like how it sort of splits out in the colours here as it goes across. Well, right. having, it's a very straight shot too, this one. Yeah, having processed the same, yeah. essentially exactly the same image from the same place, you know, mm -hmm. I went in a lot of different directions with the colour palette and this is incredibly understated. In fact, it almost feels almost desaturated for what was physically there, mm. uh, which is quite interesting um, from, from personally, you know, that that's, that's the... Um, the aesthetic that, that that Scott was running with. And it's, I think it's very elegant because of that. And it lets well, it speak for itself. There's no shouting going on here, you know, like it's, mm. it's speaking for itself. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. I've got a bit of Yosemite. Crikey. Is that a fire? In the, must yeah, be a fire. it looks yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, you wouldn't want, uh, yeah, you wouldn't want a fire there. <laughs> no, that's right down near the hotels and everything, isn't it? I was going to say, it looks very much like where I camped last time I was there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well. a, I guess it's a different or very unique take perhaps on a, a very, you know, well-photographed location and that, mm. that can very much um, yeah, change everything. everything and it shows the, you can see the, the you know, the reflection of the, the you know, the, the, the flames off the side. I would, I would argue that maybe upwards of 100,000 people have, have stood with cameras in that spot, maybe more, oh, given that there's oh, 2 million people here to go through that. And that was one of the most accessible places to take an image, but there will be almost no one with an image like that from that, yeah. from that place. Mm. Yeah, having photographed fires at night, um, I don't think the fire was as big as it looks in this, in this photograph. The, the light tends to go a long way from mm. a fire at night. And you can exactly. see that clearly there was 
some moonlight happening there as well. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, yeah to, to balance the yeah. two together, um, assuming it's a, a moonlight a lot. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. Look, I think it is because you can actually see some trailing in the stars up here. And, and I certainly would have the, the, the viewpoint of, of blending that into, to make them more still. So, you know, I think there's quite a good chance that it's a single shot there. Mm or at least a, maybe an exposure blend to, to control the highlights and the fire. But, um, yeah, beautiful. Uh, all right, next one. We've got Ben's. We have talked about Ben's image, but, yeah, well done, Ben, and um, beautiful image. Daniel Warren. How do people feel about that that kind of 50-50 composition? Because that's that's less, um, less used, I think, these days, where it's not like a... Um, reflection sort of based approach to or, or a mirroring sort of aspect sort of structurally uh, and that's I what personally I love it yeah yeah so that's, that's what yeah. really stands out about this image for me from a compositional mm. point of view mm. yeah it's also obviously gotten down down faster so that you know there's you know the horizons kind of merged you know so you can really you know there's the, it really makes the storm cloud set, uh, set out so much more and you've got this almost like a, a green coming through which to me means hail or something like yep. that so you can yep. really see how ominous um the approaching storm actually is especially with these ruffles in the clouds and, and things like that yeah but that also, that separation is absolutely key to this image like without it it would just that almost just blend into each other a little bit too much and, and it gives it its depth it pulls you through the frame it really exemplifies the the linear kind of aspects uh, to the perspective it's um yeah there's obviously that huge contrast between the textural qualities above and below yeah. you can see some really, movement really in, well um, in the yep. the heads of wheat or what have you or the grain there but i'm assuming if there's an impending storm there's going to be a little bit of wind coming around so it's going to be hard to and I guess that might, you know, that adds the drama, I suppose, that, you know, that there's... Yeah, um, good point. Yeah, um, it's, it's not a, it's not a static on. static subject, and, mm. and that's been spoken to by that level of movement. Yeah, it gives it an energy. Even it, though it, the cloud it feels is very, very ominous cool. in this corner, like something's, in, you know, really approaching from this side too. I get that feeling as well. So, um, yeah, beautiful. All right, anything else on that? No. Right. Um, Daniel again in Norway. Nice mirroring. Yeah, I mean, that really that yeah. really is the key structural aspect to it, mm. and the the separation and, and the color tone is 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 delicate, but it's it's still quite um, impactful. I think with the teal sort of tones versus the magentas, it's um it sort of ties in and pulls it up the frame. The way it washes through the the snow on the, on the higher peak as well just leads you down uh, through that sort of color further into frame. It's it's you know it's a, it's a simple image, but it's um. Yeah, it's very. It just feels very whole. Mm. It's very well seen, obviously. Just to, I'm very deliberate, um, you know, to put that foreground in there. So like almost knife-like, piercing the cloud above it. Um, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. I think we can meet one day. Maybe we should see if he wants to come on and join us. That'd be pretty. Yeah, I, I might. Yeah. I might reach out to you, Daniel. Yeah, stay tuned. Um, Been borrowing your work for years, my friend. It gets around too. Good old um, photographers and mud cracks never get. Oh, has, has anyone come across the new um, the new Instagram page, Cop Stops? If you yeah. <laughs> see that, Peter. No, what is it? Oh my uh, god, it's absolutely hilarious. Um, it, you can't go through it without just losing like your marbles. Yeah. And they make commentary about um, you know the greatest city in the world in front of you, and, and the photographers are down there shooting mud cracks and. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, nothing uh, else is yeah they, they they pick on a lot of um the iconic kind of aspects of, of landscape photographers from a from a, a, a very uh brash sort of cultural um outside point of view and they, and they just yeah. poke the absolute living bejesus out of them brilliantly um i think i know some of the people involved but they're very, very tight-lipped about who's actually running it it's um it's very surprising landscape for the netherlands um I'm not yeah. very well travelled, but I just haven't seen this sort of photography from the Netherlands. Oh, I haven't before. either. So, and also, you know, even them getting storms and that kind of thing in that sort of area um, mm. as well. I'm not familiar with their climate that much, but um, I wouldn't have imagined that to be. Uh, I could imagine it being a more of a rare occurrence, perhaps mm. you could say. It's interesting to feel that level of intensity and potency from such a tiny part of the image. Mm. Like it really feels like you can touch that or feel that. And and the breadth of the scale and the energy involved is so huge, and then it's such a tiny part of the frame that, that I think that that's that really gives 
there's so much part of its intrigue. Mm. It's got a stepped feel too. It's almost like there's a the horizon really fades off around this sort of level and it's sort of sitting up um, more flat uh, at this level. And then this is sort of equidistant uh, placed between this side and this side. So it's sort of a nice anchor, but then you can follow it back from there too. So it almost looks like a bit like a Coke bottle or something like that. Um, yeah, so no, very cool. Well, the composition works well because we could probably compare this in some ways to the previous image, which was a half and half, which wouldn't have worked in that situation. I'm sorry, the one with the grain kind of fields or whatever it was. Oh, yeah, that um, one there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah but the, the one that we're on it wouldn't work as a half and half. This is about the storm that's coming rather than the storm that's there. So having it kind of feel like it's in the distance by having it um, on the third line works really well. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. All right. Moving on, last one, a very similar location to the other one, but very different um, atmospheric conditions. Yeah. It's not easy to find a foreground like this at night as well and, and, and no. treat it so well. So, um, yeah, that's that's um, a real challenge. What works well here is uh, in his previous image in this spot, you've got like really kind of sharp looking crusty ice, whereas this time he's searched out uh, a pond that has you know, more curvy, curvaceous, soft yeah. snow. Um, that works really well with the aurora and the shapes yeah. from that as well. And it's, yeah, it's, there's it's a still kind flow. of, again, sort of a half and half too, isn't it? So he's definitely a fan of, of doing that rather than splitting it into thirds in terms of some of those compositions. So that's really cool. Yeah. Um, there might have been an attraction to keep, have more of the aurora in the sky because, you know, that's often the, the main event. So it's it's nice to see the colour reflected in the in the foreground there instead. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Mark Jackish. I've, I've definitely heard that name before. I think he's, um, you yeah, know, puts out some brilliant work. Um, yeah. Very classic Canadian scene. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really beautifully refreshing. Again, Peter, as you commented so early on, this, this to me presents as a beautifully classic scene, which some people may be intimidated to put into a contest that, that when they see the winners, you know, being such fantastical sort of style images, and it's beautiful to see just something just classic done masterfully well, you know, take its place as as it well should. Yeah. The the uh, the armature of the composition is you know quite sophisticated in the way you've got the the dark lines of the pine trees and how they swim across the the the, the scene. Um, and you know you've got that beautiful upsweep up towards the right. So it's it's a it's a disarming composition. It's it, it's classical in its subject matter, but I don't know whether it's classical in the way it's presented. But mm. uh, yeah, just the detail all the way through it. And I, I just love the fact here I can point it to Nick and say, Nick, hey Nick, there's one for us, mate. Oh, sorry, one for you. It's, it's, it's a real one. <laughs> Yeah, point taken. <laughs> Beautiful. We'll move, keep moving. Yeah, well spoken. Um, yeah, thank you. I love, um, is it Broken Spectre? Broken Spectre. Broken Spectre, yeah. And then also like, a, you know, you've got the shadow of the peak um, that, uh, that that he's probably standing on, I guess, or at least behind. Um, what did you call that, Nick? Uh, it's called a Broken Spectre. Oh, okay. So the... the, the um, Refraction. The, 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 the middle part, the... Um, the the shadow that's his shadow there in the in yep. the center standing yep. clearly standing on a peak um yeah so it's basically a, a fog bow that includes your reflection and, and you get this gotcha. um this image here and, and that that's a you know that's a clearly a straight image as well um and very very um very very fortunate to be there at that time mm. and, and, and beautifully captured it's a, a very good example of that phenomenon you really need to have just the right amount of cloud and, and yep. the, probably the temperature as well. And ice crystals would be what's doing that, I'd imagine. So, yep. um, yeah, so it's a um, very unique image. And also, you know, um, there probably would have been a temptation to maybe pull out some more of the colour, but it's, it's still been held really kind of mm. subtle there as well. So that's yep. you know, beautiful highlights here on some of the trees as well. And mm. we've also got a nice light, dark, almost like an inversion going on here. Yeah, between a little bit the of expect Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. It's really yeah, nice. Beautiful work, Matt. Mm. Oh, yes. Another one from Matt. Wow. Jeez, I adore that. Mm. Jeez, so, isn't it wonderful? We don't need trickery and all of that. If you want to use it, you can do it. But, yeah, you because know, it's funny because I, I guess a lot of the photos that I'm known for have multiple exposures or whatever. But the stuff that I do myself that I love the most that never does any well, doesn't do any good in awards, <laughs> the 
but it's it's just simple, straight seeing. It's the art of being able to you know visualize it and then present it beautifully. And Matt's certainly done that with this. Mm. Yeah, beautiful, different. Oh man, I could yeah. spend, I could spend so much time with this. I just invite you to just sit down in a beautiful seat, lean back, and just sigh and just allow yourself to just be present and on lots of different levels. This is magnificent, magnificent. Mastery. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, Thomas Putt. And that's, and that's, 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 pretty, that's pretty close to color, having shot there a few times myself. That, that's pretty accurate. That's pretty much what you're looking at. Um, and texturally also, you know, there's almost no need for any enhancement of that at all. Like the, mm. the level of texture in that substrate is, is magnificent. And um, mm. seeing that in print must just be like you know, jumping off the off the paper. Yeah. Yeah, you put that on like William Turner or something, be mm. like, oh my goodness, you just want to um brush your fingers off the edge of it. So mm. Yeah, and again, I, I haven't got any sort of compositions like that, you know, like a, this this sort of flame-like edging to it, you know, and, and that coloration really speaks to that kind of feeling um, and that sort of um, the way it translates from a physical form. Interesting forward. juxtaposition. You've got the really sharp flame-like, but then you've almost got these pools and it's almost like, you know, a, water, a pool of water or something versus a flame. So it's, mm. a, yeah, it's a sharp versus, yeah, round and soft. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Well done, Tom. Oh, you know, it's like like I just feel like it's lovers kissing in a in a toxic waste dump or something. It, it has all yeah. these kind of unusual tugs and pulls in terms mm -hmm. of its interpretation. Um, it can go all sorts of different directions, and, and some of them are appealing, and some of them are are, are um, just make you want to run away at the same time. Yeah. It it's you know that it's got heavy areas and light areas and toxic areas and romantic kind of areas, like mm -hmm. all just sort of imbued and somehow connecting themselves all the way through as a as somehow in a, co in a cohesive sort of way it's, it's a yeah. deeply intriguing capture I, I, can, I can see a an adult admonishing a small child i don't know if anyone else can see oh, that, that like the yeah. index finger there oh yeah 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 and yeah. the and the face here and the face is looking straight down at this at the um um the um you know the the brown sort of swirly yeah. shape down here which to me looks like the small child and it looks like um you know the the, the adults looking directly at the small child and the small child's cowering away from the angry adult. Yeah. Nick, you've had too many sherries tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I've had none. I've had none. Yeah, it's definitely That's, nice. Um, yeah, I've never I, seen the shot before. It just wasn't soft, the, came to me. The soft lace-like sort of texture here versus the really harsh blacks and browns, and it's just such a uh, juxtaposition, isn't it? Very so, sort of raw umbilical sort of like feel to, to it from a symbolic point of view as well, yeah. which... You know, it sort of intrigues me and, and, and challenges me at the same time, this image, in, in lots of different ways, which mm. which makes it very memorable. All right. Well, we've got to keep moving on. Um, oh, he's very changed it up completely here with a, a non-squarial. Um, and Russia and, and Lake, how do you say that? Lake Baikal? Baikal? Baikal. Baikal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Siberia. Yeah, right. Magnificent. Yeah. The, the little obviously the little fella in here um, definitely makes it um, oh absolutely, to, yeah. absolutely. and then the part. little branch next to the little fella yeah exactly yeah 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 I, I, tom told me he went and put that in <laughs> <laughs> are you staring at the pot there peter yeah totally i expect yeah. a phone call from him yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he'll right. be shouting from lake air at the moment and then, yeah, another beautiful one from Arnhem Land. He, he sure gets around. I think he's up at Lake Eyre at the moment or yeah, something. He um, yeah. So, yeah, so he doesn't, he's not afraid to get in the plane and just go. Yeah, I hope um, to get up there for a few weeks. Mm. Mm. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, beautiful light there. It's just, yeah, lovely. It's a, very much a almost optical illusion of, of this, um, um, I guess, root light structure sort of popping off of the, the green background there. Well, I think when I, when, I, when, I, when I spoke about Scott having been up in, in that kind of the edge of this area during the wet season, this was the kind of colour palette of the scenes that he was shooting. Um, really, really deep greens and, and um, you know, mixed with yellows. And it had a very heavy kind of earthy, um, very moist kind of feel about it. And, and I think Tom was up um, in the Northern Territory as well, I think, during wet season, which not many people are brave enough to go to from an aerial perspective because it's a lot more hit and miss about the kind of visibility you're going to get in the clouds. 
and he's really come away with something very special as a result, I think. Mm. Oh, my mate Ben, beautiful um, shot. Probably look at the south coast of New South Wales um, somewhere. Bamagui. Isn't it? Yeah, oh, it's got Bamagui there. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, be, I'd imagine around the Camel Rock area and that maybe Mystery Mystery Bay or something, but a Mystery Bay is it? I can't remember, but um, uh, yeah, beautiful. it could be Mystery Bay. Uh, just, yeah. yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, just um, really nicely done with the um, keeping the rainbow, but the, obviously the beams are really what's making that. And mm. that was a crepuscular rays, I guess. Um, mm. so yeah, beautifully handled. Well done, Ben. A little bit of subtlety there, and you know, there's one rock in the pond in the foreground that has this very similar light color tones to what the rock in the background does. Yeah. So it almost ties those two halves of the image together. Well said, Ben. Yeah, mm. and well spotted. Beautiful. Oh, that's great. Isn't it? Look at that. Yeah, I've seen a lot of wave shots in my life being a surfer, and, and Peter's done a lot of surf photography himself. Um, uh, but I've really seen someone that has such a porcelain sort of aesthetic to it, you know, where it feels like I can run my finger over the surface of it mm. and feel the coolness of, of rock almost or, or a sculpted shape. And yet it still has a sense of movement and, and solidity at the same time. Mm. And more so. The shutter speed, isn't it? What, what yeah, it? like just and that combination of lighting. It's a very unusual kind of color palette, too, for an ocean sort of scene. And, and that speaks to as much to what's in the frame as what's out of the frame, which is what I also find really intriguing about this image. Mm. It's reflect. It's pulling in other aspects of, of the wider landscape. It's a very reflect. feathered sort of, you know, f- you know, soft and beautiful. Yeah, I want to see a skull or something in there as well. Yeah, face, yeah, yeah. 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 eyes, and... true. yeah. Oh yeah, just in here. Wow. Actually, yeah, Aaron, it looks a bit like there. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, moving along. Um, beautiful woodland scene. Um, yeah, they've done really well with such a chaotic scene. I mean, uh, Nick's probably one of the best. Uh, around that photographing forest scenes and to s- make something this chaotic legible is so incredibly hard. Mm. Yeah, there's a Matt, real Matt, would, you, would you say that's a desaturated interpretation or, or yep. more authentic one? Like, uh, or from a fog, like a yeah. It's it's probably it's probably more accurate. It's probably uh, done without a polarizer, done with a. Adobe standard profile as opposed to Adobe landscape or something like that, but it's it's um, you know it's very muted in tone and um, and there's yeah, yeah, well, there is a neutral, t- Adobe neutral something yeah yeah there is a temptation with these sort of things to put a bit more saturation in than um, than may have been there. Um, I've certainly gone down that path myself, and um, yeah, this is a, a yeah great a great shot of a, a well photographed forest. I think this was probably. That um, Wisman's Wood or, or similar or, or very similar to that. I think that's in Dartmoor, um, and uh, it's a tiny patch of forest. Mm. And they and the, the the sheer volume of amazing images that comes out of this patch of forest, and they're all they're all um, all, all different in composition because of the chaotic nature of it. Um, you know, it's just a it's an enthralling sort of place, and um, and Nick's done beautifully well with this. Mm. All right, moving along. Oh, oh that's a got a level lenticular. Goodness me. It reminds me a bit of, of one of Ricardo's images when he won um, mm. landscape of the year in Australia. Um, yeah. yeah he had a more sepia sure kind of interpretation, but it was a very similar sort of shape and structure and, mm. and clouds. And it's, it's, it's just, it just feels like poetry. Mm. Mm, you know, I almost feel words coming out like somebody speaking to me in, 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 in poetry. And it's, it's, it's asking me to listen and use my ears as much as my eyes somehow. Um, it's, it's also very, um, very contrast, isn't it? I mean, there's yeah. no, no, no details in those blacks and some, well, at least in the, in the, in what I'm seeing. So it's mm. really trying to highlight the cloud and the, and the snow there on the peak. And can, can you imagine the a traditional RPP panel with uh, new judges, Peter? It's like, Oh, there's no detail in the blacks, mate. I don't know. I oh, know. Uh, no judges don't have a problem with no details in the black. I mean, the old black exactly. and white photography, look at, yeah, think of um, Ansel Adams, think of um, Edward Weston, you know, when they were creating their blacks. I mean, there's nothing wrong with black in a print at all. The black no. is beautiful. Look yeah, at no, Irving that was my, Penn, that was my, my favourite no, like portrait it, photographer. It, it absolutely works because of it. Mm. Yeah, it definitely reminds me of infrared too. If you if you do that kind of um, uh, blue sky or just render completely black like that as well, so yeah, yeah very, it gives very, it so much power um, mm. because of it. 
Mm. There may yeah. have been a couple of arguments about the monochrome award um, with this and the, the other mm. beautiful shop. Um, this really has a, a, a very strong contrast aesthetic and, um, and I can imagine a few discussions between the judges mm. uh, on the merits of the two and trying to separate them. Um, yeah, beautiful ah, shop. That's what it's all about, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, goodness. Look at that. Got to keep an eye on the time, Lukey, as well. Yeah, um, we'll go uh, maybe another five or so minutes um, and, yep. and you know, close out from there. Um, it's it's a it's hard to we always knew that we're probably never going to get the full hundred, and I guess that's what we can do is encourage folks to head over onto the the okay. website and leave it a mystery the there description and um, yeah and, and go through it yourself and pour through the images and, and it's really a great thing to do. Yeah. Love the Delta Venus. Start getting, Earth start getting your photos ready for next year. Yep. <laughs> Never too early. Yeah, I'll be entering next year. I'm hoping to give it a red hot go next year too. Actually, maybe I'll enter. <laughs> do it. <laughs> There's a lot of space now, Nick. In here, aren't there? Right. Eh? Oh, we do much. love you. I have to go and shoot something else then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh wow. Yeah. This is this is one of my personal favourites. I think uh, I haven't yet sort of described in words or, or put into words in my own mind why, um, because it's a bit beyond words for me in, in so many ways. Um, the design, the the, the mm -hmm. dynamics, the the um, the linear and, and vertical and curved aspects, the, the softness, the, the subtlety, the mm -hmm. separation of of colour tone. Um, it's just you know the, every area of this image is 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 a, just a delight really, mm. and it just feels incredibly deliberately masterfully composed, yeah. and yet it feels like just seen. Mm. You know, there's nothing fabricated about it or created about it. it in terms of its feeling, um, it just yeah. feels masterful to me in so many ways. Yeah, I agree. Get her on the show. Yeah. Mm. What's that? So you should get her on the show. It works amazing. Oh, oh fantastic. Yeah, no, I'd we'll love be. to, actually. Do you think she's open to that? Well, we met her through the natural landscape, remember, when we had that little Zoom oh, chat? Right. Oh. Yeah, we had the big chat for mm. the finalist. Yeah, yeah right. she's got beautiful work. She's got another one in, in as well, I think. Uh, mm. Beautiful. Well oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here it is. Oh. yeah, that's that's fantastic. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. So that was in the Natural Landscape Awards as well. That's right, right. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, it was right up there. Uh, too. It's all yep. coming to me now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone that says Photoshop Awards, this is exactly the same picture that was entered in the Natural Landscape Awards as well. Yeah, and it's right in there. Peter's nodding his head. Another good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, this is the kind of image that completely crossed the medium. I mean, this could be equally. Um, uh, accessible and, and, and believable in a, in a bunch of different mediums outside of photography, mm. exactly as it's presented. And, mm. and I personally love creating images like that and, and being present with images like that, that, that somehow transcend the photographic genre uh, mm. in terms of how they present. This is definitely one of those images. Mm. All right. Well, let's say we'll do um, two more after this one, if that's okay with everyone, and then and then we'll, we'll close it there. Um, Beautiful Astro Pano. Astro yeah, a bane of my existence. But um, yeah, some people can do it exceptionally well. It's done very well here. It's very, very wide. It must be like that's where 180 degree degree. Well, be 180 yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's yeah. very nicely handled. Seeing the photographer actually included the tripod on the side rather than cropping it out. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that that's sort of indicating his own presence, which mm. I think is is subtle, but I think. Um, I really appreciate that actually, because mm. that they don't they didn't need to be in there to to balance the composition. So that's a deliberate choice, mm. I, I would assume. And and it's kind of like just quietly understated. Well, well, I'm part of the scene as well, you know, like any artist is, um, by by being there themselves. I think yeah, it's, did, um, you did not notice that, Peter? I, I saw you looking a bit more closely. Nah, well, I'm not one of the judges, but no, I hadn't noticed it. No. Nah. Definitely, um, but it'd be interesting to know how it would have gone if, if that flare wasn't coming off. I'm assuming the lighthouse there too. So I think that's quite a, a catch that pulls you into that sort of third of the frame and, 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 and sort the of completes on the, other the side that it's creating on the mountain. Yeah, absolutely. yes. Oh, there you go. Yes, I didn't even yeah. notice that. Yeah, and then yeah, that's, that's a, sort of a natural finish point to that beautiful 
um, uh, traffic trail there. So, yeah. yeah, well, to me, it's an entry point for the right hand side as well to, to come okay, in. Okay, yeah. You it's a sense back. of continuation beyond the frame. Like, I've, I've only stopped at 180 degrees, but there's more, is what it speaks to to oh, me. Right. And and quite magnificent sort of um, material out there as well. well it's so. actually sick. It, it, it keeps going around, then you go back down, and then you come, you know, so you can sort of have that sort of thing going on with it too. Well, so. I mean, compositionally, I think where yeah. that where that um, light trail meets the Milky Way is, is very, very important for the, the success of that composition, I think, in mm. a way. Yeah, yeah, it. definitely, yeah. definitely. All right, great. Second last, another beautiful monochrome of a snow-capped peak. This time the lenticular is dark. Yeah, um, back at home. Been up that mountain a few times. <laughs> Talk about it all. Definitely. So processed very differently to that other one, the, the similar sort of uh, subject material, but um, this time with the with the um, shadow detail there. Interesting. Yeah, it's very different having such an open um, kind of shadow shadow component to it you know where every sort of structure is part of it compared to the other it's it's quite it, yeah it's it's wonderful to see such opposition in terms of how the treatment's been done on a similar subject matter i'm interested enough that's infrared or if it's snow in the foreground there because if that was grass it would render white or if it's just patches of snow there but um yeah quite quite a nice um well seen shot and then uh, um, to finish off lucky oh, last um Peak District, the roaches. Oh, it's beautiful. Mm. So delicate. Mm. It just feels like they, they, these trees can tell you a lot of stories. There's a mm. lot of age that feels mm. present here. Uh, the color palette kind of speaks to that, you know, that this could be presented from 100 years ago quite convincingly in some aspects of it as, as aesthetic. So it's a very, very lovely, timeless quality. Um, a lot of intricacy, I think, I feel, and just how beautifully subtle are, are, are the, is the shadow kind of areas of the frame, you know, and the tonal palette sort of all the way through. And and there's a gentle kind of simple, um, subtle path that you can walk through the middle of the frame through the back as well, along that diagonal. Like, uh, it's anyway, reminded me not to come back in my next life as Robin Hood because it looks a bit cold out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she looks pretty fresh. It does, yeah, that's, um, that wouldn't have been a warm one. Oh, that's beautiful, cool. England, isn't it? Because it would have been quite low down, relatively speaking. Beautiful, well done, Michael. And we'll leave it there. And um, as I mentioned earlier, um, yes, the, the, they're all there on the on the website. So do take a look, and, and it's obviously great inspiration to to enter next year. And, and Peter, did you want to speak more about um, some competitions coming up? Well, if you well, this is the uh, landscape place, so it's probably not the place to mention the uh, international portrait photographer of the year, which we're oh, that do. will be opening up I in the next couple it. of weeks. So, uh, but if you've got a a wider a view of photography, uh, that that's uh, another opportunity to get your your work uh, as a, a part. It's uh, going to our second year, so it's a bit smaller. So, get get yourself in there on the ground floor. Is it very similar in terms of setup, in terms of a top 101? And, and, and yeah, the similar, but we've got four categories. Um, so okay. it's a little bit different just to acknowledge the different ways that you can do portraiture. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's similar uh, in that the output is the same, in that we've got a book with 101, and but the prize structure is a little bit different. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so if you're into so, portraits, then that's... So again, if, you, if you're not... Um, if you're not uh, saturated by the top 101, you've got 202 <laughs> uh, for the first time, which I highly recommend going through. And I feel like there's one other person I really want to acknowledge before we go, and that's David Evans. Yep. And, uh, you know, Peter would know a lot more than me, the kind of work and, and vision and um, consistency and how much a part of his life that this contest has been. And I feel like we we did actually invite him on the show and he, he, he wasn't um, wasn't able to come. But I, I do feel like we probably haven't given them the recognition and the voice that he probably deserves for his role in this whole thing. Peter, I don't know if you want to quickly speak to that. He, before he's, we go. Uh, he, he likes to be quiet a little bit, I think. Um, he's um, he, he never answers my telephone calls. He just likes to text messages. But uh, I think <laughs> yeah. he likes me. I'm not quite too sure. Yeah, I get the same. <laughs> No, but uh, David's, uh, it was, it's funny, um, it was only for the last couple of years we've actually had one of his photographs in the book. And I think it was a little bit of him, you know, not quite too sure. I mean, everybody who enters these awards, they're all photographers. Where do you stand in the world? 
And then a few years ago when he won um, Australian Landscape Photographer of the Year, I think that gave him a little bit more confidence in who he is as a photographer because he takes beautiful stuff. I mean, you know, that, that's, that series that's of images cool. that came back from uh, Finland or Sweden or wherever he was, was hiding that's that right, particular yeah. year, just, just sensational. And so uh, in, when you look at the uh, awards book now, we've got one of his photos in there too, which I'm very uh, good, good to see him in there as well. Fantastic. Awesome. Brilliant. Well, done, one, one last note before we finish. Um, if anyone wants to come down to the exhibition, I'm actually going to be there myself on Saturday and running a beautiful artist talk for a couple of hours in the afternoon to talk about all the crazy stories and and uh, insights into the into the work. Um, and uh, that was hasn't been advertised because it, it, we only just extended the exhibition and I'm about to do a post after it afterwards. But um, yeah, feel free to come down and spend some quality time and the following Sunday as well. So 12th awesome. and 20th. Yeah, very worth, worth checking out if you haven't seen it already. Um, next week, we have Will Patino joining us, which I'm really, really excited about. I'm a massive fan of Will, and he's just been put out the most incredible gallery of New Zealand seascape images. Um, yeah. Very well worth um, checking his website out. I'm sure we'll be seeing all about that um, next week anyway. The special uh, start will actually be 7 uh, p.m. rather than 7.30, and that's just purely because of the New Zealand time zone difference. We don't want to keep Will up too late. So we'll definitely communicate that out. Um, Family man, has got young ones. Uh, get yeah, but I'm very, very excited to have him back on. He's, he's been on a few times and he's always amazing value so um and um the the place his backyard being fjordland of new zealand um it doesn't get too much better than that apart from maybe tassie but um we won't talk about that um so yes very much huge thank you to that. peter and matt for your time yes. really really deeply appreciate it you, and thanks. i really thoroughly enjoyed our discussion tonight and i think a lot of people the world over are going to be quite engaged with with how open-minded and and objective we, we were with what can be a a wraparound sort of conversation that never ends. And, and I, I feel like it was quite refreshing and very engaged and very even, evenly, um, evenly held space that we all did. So uh, thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Awesome. Well, Hi, um, everyone. Be well. Take, take care. And um, yeah, we'll see you next week at the special time of um, seven, four, 7 Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Don't forget um, to like and subscribe. Yeah, please do. Please do. Catch you later and have a good